tonight's topic is Christianity Dangerous. Our first speaker, Arn Ra. I'm going to say this. Anytime he and I are in the same room, people ask me how often the Wizard Convention comes through. <laughs> Arn is the Regional Director for American Atheists. He's also a board member of both the American Atheists and the Center for Free Thought Equality. He's the director of Philodeny Explorer Project. Arn is the YouTube atheist and an advocate for rationalism in science classrooms. His videos promote secular education and skeptical thinking, often focusing on falsehoods of creationism, among others, have been mirrored, featured, referenced, and recommended by many professional scientists, secularists, and educators, and has attracted more than 130 subscribers to his YouTube channel. Additionally, all of Arn's financial support comes from patrons on patreon.com. For anyone interested in supporting his work, please welcome, speaking to the topic, Is Christianity Dangerous? Arn Raw. Thank you very much, Ezra. Uh, and thank you all for uh, having me back here. It's going to take a minute. I wasn't warned that he was going to announce me, so I haven't even got my stuff set up yet. All right, so. <clears throat> Uno momento por favor. Is Christianity dangerous? It has been called the bloodiest religion in all human history, even compared to Islam. Just look at the series of barbaric atrocities known as the Holy Wars of Christians versus Muslims. And One moment, please. Okay. When the Washington Times asked which religion is the most violent, they noted that Christians caused 50 times more violent deaths than Muslims just over the last century. But in all fairness, there are more Muslims than there are, there are more Christians than there are Muslims, if you accept Catholics as Christian. And Christians don't usually kill each other over religion, over religion at least not anymore. The British Raj, or crown rule of India, could be said to be Christians versus Hindus too, but the purpose of that conflict wasn't spiritual or theological, it was purely political, imperialism. Likewise, Stalin, who was an atheist, had millions of people killed, but not in the name of atheism. That, too, was political totalitarianism, wherein the government prohibits opposition parties, restricts individual objections to state politics, exercises extreme control over public and private life. A totalitarianism is the form of government that Christian dominionists actually want and are trying to achieve. <clears throat> they say they want less government but they really want a grossly overbloated military and militarized police force, which also penalizes expression of uncomfortable opinions, imprisons protesters, and denigrates the press as fake news. While allowing unfair religious privileges and unjust exceptions, and governing every aspect of your personal life, especially your sex life, restricting your practice and preference of partners. That's way too much government for me, and I'm on the left. Everyone thinks Islam is more violent because the Quran says to kill the infidel, but the Bible says that too in Deuteronomy 13 and 17, where you are to kill anyone, even a beloved friend or family member who doesn't believe in your God and dares suggest that you shouldn't either. Numbers 31 says whole communities can be slaughtered and their preteen children taken into sexual slavery simply for believing in other gods. And of course, Exodus 22 says, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. I'm sure no one expects the Spanish Inquisition to come up in this debate. Mark Twain remarked on that saying, during many ages there were witches. The Bible said so. The Bible commanded that they should not be allowed to live. Therefore the church after 800 years gathered up its halters, thumbscrews and firebrands and set about its holy work in earnest. She worked hard at it night and day during nine centuries and imprisoned, tortured, hanged and burned whole hordes and armies of witches and washed the Christian world clean with their foul blood. Then it was discovered there was no such thing as witches and never had been. One does not know whether to laugh or cry. 
Penn State University professor of religious history Philip Jenkins says that Islamic scriptures in the Quran were actually far less bloody and less violent than those in the Bible, that the Bible frequently promotes genocide more than 70 times. Consequently, the history of Christianity is strewn with genocide justified. He said that it is often used, for example, in American stories of the confrontation with Indians. Not just is it legitimate to kill Indians, but you are violating God's law if you do not. Professor Jenkins acknowledges that Christianity is not like that anymore, owing to what he calls holy amnesia, where believers conveniently forget or simply fail to notice any of the indefensible atrocities in their supposedly holy writ, as if all that inhuman evil reaped at the hands of righteous believers in the name of God was merely symbolic. Another example of Christian genocide is when the Nazis tried to exterminate the Jews in the Holocaust of World War II. Hitler declared, both publicly and privately, that the anti-Semitism of his new Christian social movement, as he called it, was based on religious ideas instead of racial knowledge, and that his initial violent attacks against the Jews in the Kristallnacht was inspired by the anti-Semitism of Reverend Martin Luther, father of Protestant Christianity. Hitler also rejected evolution outright in Mein Kampf, wherein he declared himself to be a creationist and he ordered all of Darwin's books to be burnt. Hitler believed in racial superiority and eugenics. Darwin did not. Gore Vidal famously observed that most, more people have been killed in the name of Jesus Christ than in any other name in the history of the world. Christian history is rife with centuries of near-continuous overlapping wars between Orthodox Christians and Catholics, Catholics versus Protestants, Protestants against Puritans, and Puritans against Quakers, all of them killing each other in the name of the same God they all share. How dangerous is that? If you're born in a Protestant area, you'd better be Protestant until the Inquisition comes along. Then you'd better be good at lying. If you're born in a Catholic country, you'd better be Catholic. There's no room for analysis. Either one is a thought crime for which you're not allowed to use reason. You're not allowed to think about it or question what you're told to believe because for most of history, any of you could be imprisoned for your opinion or executed on the capital crimes of blasphemy, heresy, or apostasy, which in a secular society are not crimes at all. Fortunately, the founding fathers of this nation knew that every time religion has ever had rule over law, it has historically always resulted in violations of both life and liberty, where righteousness results in a perversion of justice. For example, the Salem witch trials demonstrated precisely why supernatural claims cannot be considered a valid influence over criminal court case or public policy addressing real world issues. That's why our founding fathers established this country not on Judeo-Christian principles, but but on secular, values, secular values, such that in this country, blasphemy is not a crime, it's a right. Yet inter-Christian bloodshed continued even in the United States despite the First Amendment with Executive Order Number 44. That was signed by the governor of Missouri in 1838. It allowed American militias to hunt down and kill whole families of men, women, and children. And we're not talking about Native Americans either, but white people. It was called the Mormon Execution Order. It's the reason the Mormons had to flee Illinois and Missouri to make a new home in the deserts of Utah. That law was not taken off the books until 1976, during my lifetime. So Mormons who know their history understand better than most Christians do why you can't have freedom of religion without freedom from religion, meaning that the state shouldn't have an official religion because then believers in every other faith become second-class citizens to be oppressed, subjugated, and in many instances killed. It is true that Christianity was suppressed as illegal once upon a time in the very beginning. It was blasphemous to the Jews and the Romans who had been tolerant of many provincial religions until then referred to the early Christians as atheists because they lacked theism, being no more than a heretical cult of self-deluded mystics at that time. But once they had a convert in command, Constantine, all that changed. And those renunciate pacifists suddenly turned into holy warriors of the prosperity gospel. Once Christianity was legalized, it was soon illegal to be anything else. Because every religion is relatively humble, charitable, and kind in the minority, but they all become criminally oppressive in the majority. We see that with the Islamification of Europe today, as with the Christianization of Europe centuries ago. 
and I fear we might see a resurgence of that because there are more dangers to Christianity than just the hazards of religious war. The threat of Christian dominionism is the reason that I became an activist. Back around Y2K, I heard from religious extremists bragging about how their congregation voted exactly as their preacher instructed, along with a coalition of other churches illegally voting as a block to position certain evangelical judges and senators and so on in what was later to reveal to be the wedge strategy. Although the people I was hearing from at that time were working with reconstructionists from the Chalcedon Institute who wanted to replace our democratic republic with a theocracy that would enforce Levitical law. If you think Sharia law is bad, read Leviticus and imagine our government enforcing that. This country would be worse than any Islamic state where you can be executed simply for working on weekends and where you are literally not even free to think your own thoughts. Christianity is just one of many religions, and all religions are faith-based belief systems, meaning that they have required beliefs and prohibited beliefs, things you have to believe or be damned if you don't, and things you're forbidden to think and will be punished if you do. Whereas a secular society allows and encourages free thought and the free exchange of ideas, which Christianity cannot endure or allow. Even the conservative Senator Barry Goldwater worried about our current political situation, saying, if and when these preachers get control of the Republican Party, and they're sure trying hard to do so, it's going to be a terrible damn problem. Fortunately, frankly, these people frighten me. Politics and governing demand compromise, but these Christians believe they are acting in the name of God, and so they can't and won't compromise. And that's another reason Christianity is dangerous, because if you elect candidates who are strong in their faith and firm in their convictions, then you've chosen leaders and judges who have already decided your fate with a stoic conviction that no logic, reason, or evidence will ever correct. Faith means they will not be reasoned with. If people think that God's law is higher than human law, then there are Christians who believe that they are above the law. The only Christian principles that actually did influence the establishment of this otherwise secular nation was slavery and misogyny, which is why women were denied the vote until only 100 years ago. Both of these errors had to be corrected, which was hard to do because the good book promotes things that we know to be immoral. Confederate President Jefferson Davis said that slavery was the main issue behind the Civil War, over and above everything else. He said that slavery was established by decree of Almighty God, being sanctioned in the Bible in both Testaments, from Genesis to Revelation. So the bloodiest conflict ever in American soil could have been avoided entirely were it not for Jesus' endorsement of slavery. Christianity has been used to promote every type of prejudice, beginning with Jesus himself, saying he was here only for his chosen people, denying his gospel to the Gentiles, and dismissing Samaritans with a racial slur. In 1493, Pope Alexander VI issued the Doctrine of Discovery, which stated that any land not already owned and controlled by Christians was to be discovered, or rather conquered, by Christians. Existing regimes were to be overthrown, their resources exploited, and their prior inhabitants enslaved and converted in order to further further strengthen the church. In 1550, the church debated whether the native inhabitants of the Greater Antilles were fully human as their one defender insisted, or as his four missionary opponents declared that they were instead natural slaves and soulless talking animals in human guise. It's not just centuries ago, either. Evangelist Bob Jones said that if you are against segregation and racial separation, you are against God. Oral Roberts held the same position. I was a boy when the anti-miscegeneration law was struck down in 1967. Had I been of my father's generation, then the marriage I have now would have been illegal because of my wife's Vietnamese ancestry and because of the previous trial judge's Christian beliefs. He ruled that Almighty God created the races white, black, yellow, Malay, and red, and he placed them on separate continents. The fact that he separated the races shows that he did not intend for the races to mix. Ignoring, for the moment, that none of this raving insanity counts as fact and should never have been uttered by a judge, understand that his exact statement or sentiment is still repeated on the websites of the Ku Klux Klan who declare that they are exclusively Christian creationists who do not believe in evolution. Like all Abrahamic religions, Christianity suffers from and imposes sexual repression such that violent scenes are graphically enhanced and celebrated, but scenes of mere nudity must be censored as pornographic. 
How can one even pretend to support family values if you think that breastfeeding a baby should be done in the unclean conditions of a public toilet rather than at table number five in the company of family and friends? Who cares if it offends some guy who calls his wife mother? That's why... <laughs> That's why we circumcise baby boys, which is a pointless and potentially dangerous permanent mutilation of the most sensitive organ without anesthesia or consent of a minor and for no good reason but only to diminish his potential appreciation of sex. An indefensible act of evil. Protestant preachers are now catching up to Catholic priests in terms of constant confirmations of child molestation, implying that attempts at abstinence or even just prudishness, repulsing at one of our strongest biological drives, not surprisingly distorts one into fiendish perversion, if they weren't already that way to begin with. The few who do brag about having a healthy sex life also say that they hate gays, even though they're often caught having gay sex. The Bible belt is also the meth belt, the abortion belt, and the gay porn belt with self-hating homophobes throughout fundamentalism. Much of the bigotry is based on false dichotomies between good and evil, male and female, gay or straight, seemingly unable to accept any concept that isn't simply binary. So trans people and queer folk might even be killed in the streets because the book of Leviticus says they're an abomination and their blood will be upon them. Of course, it also says not to get tattoos or eat shellfish either, but cherry-picking hypocrites don't pay attention to that part. The game is to feign persecution while persecuting everyone else. I've actually heard Christians complain that they are not allowed to force their religious opinions and restrictions onto those who believe differently, as if Christians are being oppressed by not being allowed to oppress everyone else. Christian bigotry is dangerous because the religious right are pushing legislation that denies everyone else their rights so that those of other religions don't get equal consideration. Those with no religion are forced to conform to and respect someone else's irrational delusion, while public schools deceive, mislead, and indoctrinate with lies and politicized propaganda, and people who are genderqueer are denied even the most basic rights. The first time I ever saw Ted Haggard, he was lobbying the Colorado legislature to legalize discrimination against homosexuals to deny them jobs and housing. Here in Texas, they tried to pass the bathroom bill, forcing everyone to use the same toilet that matches their birth certificate because some hateful morons in the state Senate think that people who look like women should, look, should use the men's room and vice versa. But thus far, no trans people have ever molested children in public bathrooms like some conservative Christian politicians have. So what happens when your slightly masculine looking great aunt gets ID'd by a cop coming out of the ladies room? Even if she has her birth certificate on her at that moment, there's no way to justify the embarrassment nor the injustice of laws that are written purely to promote discrimination born of hatred and stupidity. Now the Vatican has released a statement saying that trans people annihilate the concept of nature. This from a criminal organization whose job description is the denial of nature in favor of the supernatural, meaning the crazy crap they made up to extort money and power from unwary masses. Christianity's greatest danger of deception is undeniable. All religions depend on asserting baseless speculation as though it were a matter of fact, pretending to know things you don't know, dishonest though that is. There is no truth to any religion, nothing we can show to be true about any of them, but they are all based on a hell of a lot of lies. Remember when Pope Benedict told people in disease-ridden African countries that the use of condoms would actually spread AIDS? Remember when Pat Robertson told 30,000 some odd followers to go out and kill homosexuals where you find them because he said that would prevent earthquakes? Did you see Rick Wiles recently announced that eating plant-based hamburgers is a satanic plot to change our DNA to prevent our being born again? He's lobbying for the meat industry, no doubt. Remember when Copeland ministers, Ministries said that Christians didn't need to vaccinate their kids because Jesus redeemed them? That bit of ignorance caused their congregation to have a measles outbreak. Christianity is dangerous in that it provides cover for idiocy, dishonesty, paranoid delusions, and serious psychiatric disorders. Asking whether Christianity is dangerous is like asking whether smoking is dangerous. 
Somehow rock stars like Keith Richards managed to keep smoking even into their 70s, possibly with the help of a whole lot of other drugs. And some moderate Christians live long lives and seem just fine too. So some argue that Christianity is only dangerous if you take it too far, which is definitely true, and there are myriad examples to prove that. But I've seen that just like with addictive drugs, there's some degree of danger if you take any at all. Religion is like an addictive drug. Some think it's sexy, while others see it as poisonous. That's why those who quit these addictions also tend to be the most outspoken uh, opponents of those habits. The best champions of reason over religion are those who were once ministers, missionaries, seminary students, and so on, who were educated by and dedicated to their faith before they realized what a problem faith is. Not just their particular faith, but the auto-deceptive nature of religious faith in general. Faith is not just a synonym of trust. It's a belief that is based on logical fallacies, arguments from authority, or subjective impressions, anything but scientific evidence. It's just a question about how, how much scientific evidence you reject. Are you a geocentric young earth creationist who believes the earth is flat, just like the Bible says, no matter what the facts are? Or do you accept evolution as long as you can imagine that it is guided by God? In either case, at least you don't speak in tongues while drinking Drano and dancing with poisonous snakes because you probably already know that even if you had enough faith to fill a mountain, it still wouldn't move a mustard seed. Even the slightest acceptance of Christianity still requires some denial of natural science, even if it's just making believe things that are not evidently or even possibly true, like the soul, for example, because you have to believe that or else. You'll face the empty threat of a fate worse than death if you don't make yourself believe. There's a definite danger to your ability to reason if you've been conditioned that, what, that you must believe man-made mythology of impossible absurdity and for no good reason, even when all the evidence says otherwise. Christianity is dangerous to children because they're told that they're born defective and need to ask forgiveness for even being born at all and that they'd better not think, think rationally about that or they'll burn in hell. Intellectually damaging child abuse. We've seen hundreds of children die in this country because their parents prayed over them but denied them medicine for easily treatable ailments. These kids all died because their parents were effectively wishing on a star, hoping for a magical enchantment that was never going to make their, their wish come true. Religious extremists have a distorted view of family values, where you're supposed to hold your pretend relationship with your magic imaginary friend above the real relationships that you have with your spouse, your parents, or even your children. Because remember, Jesus said in Matthew 10 that you cannot follow him unless you hate your sister and your brother and your father and your mother and your wife and even your own life. Call no one father on earth, he said, for you have one father, the one in heaven. So forget about those people who really should matter more by virtue of the fact that they're really there and you don't have to pretend that they are. The cornerstone of most extreme religious right conservative Christians is the abortion issue, misrepresented as though it was ever about killing babies, ignoring, of course, that chapter 5 of the book of Numbers allows abortion with God's direct approval and involvement, even for the trivial reason of suspicion of infidelity. Yet with recent comments by Clyde Chambliss, sponsor of the Alabama abortion bill, we now have an admission that it's not about the life of the fertilized embryo, not in a laboratory setting, because he said that doesn't count as a baby, nor even a life, unless it's inside the mother. Anti-abortion bills are not pro-life, they're anti-woman, designed to deny them control of their own reproduction. Then there's the issue of morality. Statistically, there's a negative correlation between religiosity and what we typically think of as moral behavior. I have lists of studies showing that the most religious countries, especially those that are historically predominantly Christian, also tend to have the highest murder rate, and the same is true of most religious areas within the United States, with special emphasis on hate crimes. Secular nations show the opposite tendencies, where the less religious they are, the more peaceful they tend to be. According to sociology, sociology professor Phil Zuckerman, it is the highly secularized countries that tend to fare the best in terms of crime rates, prosperity, equality, freedom, democracy, women's rights, human rights, educational attainment, and life expectancy, although there are exceptions such as Vietnam and China which have famously poor human rights records. And those nations with the highest rates of religiosity tend to be the most problem ridden in terms of high violent crime rates, high infant mortality rates, high poverty rates, and high rates of corruption. 
Here in America, evangelical Christians are more likely to condone the murder or torture of prisoners where non-religious people are more likely to consider that morally wrong. Evangelicals also have the highest divorce rate and the highest rates of teen pregnancy. Here in Texas, we still have the highest rates of repeat teen pregnancy because we used to teach abstinence only in place of sex education. Fundamentalist Christians even have a higher rate of abortions, a testament to their hypocrisy. But it gets even worse than that. Child protective, child protective services and other agencies report a significant majority of abusers and molesters identify as very religious, and the more religious they are, the worse offenders they are with more sexual offense convictions against more and younger victims. Yet, believers argue that the less religious we are, the less moral we are. The studies, the polls, the history do not support their claim. Even second-hand Christianity is dangerous to everyone because now that the Republican Party is almost entirely evangelical and under the control of the, the fossil fuel industry personified by the Koch brothers, the religious right cannot admit the impact of our industries on the environment without hurting profits in the next fiscal quarter. So the Texas Republican Party platform says that anthropogenic climate change must be treated as a questionable theory not to be accepted or believed no matter what the cost of Denying this reality will be to our planet and the future of our species. Christianity is definitely dangerous, even in small doses. Another hand for Arn. Our second speaker almost won the longest distance traveled, but there's a man in the back that drove here from Colorado. So, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, he flew from Colorado. He traveled from, there you go. Anyone further than Colorado, we'll give you a free beer mug. All right, our second speaker is Michael Jones. He's a Christian apologist and the founder and presiding and president of Inspiring Philosophy Ministries, an organization that is building a video library for every apologetic topic out there. Michael creates videos that defend the biblical worldview and corrects misinformation among Christians. Speaking to the topic, is Christianity dangerous? Please welcome Michael Jones. I know. Let me get my timer. Good evening. Well, I have been looking forward to this for months, and I'd like to thank Aaron Raw for agreeing to the debate in the Bible and Beer Consultorium for hosting tonight. I'd also like to thank James Kunz in the back for helping fund my trip here. And I'd also like to thank the channel Rational Perspectives, formerly known as, formerly known as DRES83, for helping me prep for tonight. And without that, that out of the way, I want to dive right in. There seems to be some confusion about the uh, topic of tonight. The topic is not, are Christians dangerous? If that was the topic tonight, in one sense, many Christians would probably say yes, because our own Bible says all humans are sinful, depraved, and that we seek to fill our own selfish desires. And that is the reason we need Christianity. So in one sense, I'm sure plenty of Christians would agree, yeah, at times Christians can be dangerous. In another sense, Aaron might have to admit Christians are not dangerous because he felt safe to come to tonight's event and I don't see a bulletproof vest on him. <laughs> but that is not the topic tonight. The topic tonight is, is Christianity dangerous? Aaron has listed several examples of Christians and some people who are not Christians who have done bad things. He only had to sit in one church service to know that Christians sin every day. Arne has agreed to debate the affirmative tonight, so he has to show that Christianity necessarily is the cause of these bad things that Christians have done, and I will argue this cannot be demonstrated. From watching numerous of Arne's uh, past debates, uh, including one of his recent debates with Tyler Vella, he has attempted to argue certain core tenets of Christianity have dangerous effects. And he has argued that the promotion of faith in the Bible causes people to become less rational or intelligent, in so many of his own words. 
from viewing numerous of his lectures, his reasoning seems to be, Bible verse says X, R and interpret X to mean Y, and most Christians probably also or must interpret X to mean Y, and Y has dangerous effects. So for example, Aaron reads a verse that encourages faith among Christians. Okay. Aaron then interprets this verse to mean rejecting evidence and reason and believing blindly. And most Christians probably or must think this way, and this has horrible consequences in society. I will argue none of these can be demonstrated. They're all leaps in logic, and they're completely unjustified. Many of Aaron's attempts to argue, or many of his attempts to interpret scripture passages are based on a misunderstanding of the context. And even if he is right in his interpretation, there is no statistical evidence the majority of Christians agree with him or even have to. On top of that, he has to show empirically that this leads to negative results in society. Random examples from his experience or from the media or the news don't demonstrate that. I could find numerous examples of atheists, feminists, or humanists doing bad things, but it would be absurd for me to make the leap in logic and say this means atheism or humanism caused these bad things. So for example, there is one study out there called Mentalizing Defects Constrained Belief in a Personal God, which shows an association between atheism and autism. But it would be ridiculous for me to suggest atheism somehow causes autism. In psychology, this is called an attribution error, when you unjustifiably attribute an effect to something. By RN listing examples of Christians doing bad things, this is actually not proof Christianity caused these bad things. One researcher in his paper, To Err in Their Ways, The Attribution Bias of New Atheists, has specifically called out new atheists for committing this fallacious reasoning quite often. So a lot of the arguments Aaron made can be pointed out as nothing more than attribution errors. He has to demonstrate for us that Christianity, as a form of intrinsic religiosity, is the direct cause of these alleged harmful effects. Now I could go through and list a bunch of nice Bible verses or list a bunch of nice things Christians have done, but Aaron and I would be talking past one another. Therefore, I propose an, uh, an area of mutual agreement. Science. Because the fact remains that numerous psychologists and social scientists have looked into this subject to see if Christianity, which is a form of intrinsic religiosity, does correlate with negative social behaviors or lower quality of life. And the overwhelming consensus in scientific literature is resounding no. In fact, numerous studies show intrinsic religiosity does increase one's overall quality of life and has been positively associated with increased ethical behavior and overall well-being. Now, there will always be exceptions to the rule. Some studies do show religiosity is associated with various negative effects. But by and large, the consensus in peer-reviewed literature is intrinsic religiosity not only is not dangerous, but that is it associated with beneficial results in multiple ways. Some studies even cite a causal relationship, which and I'll note some of them. I'll mainly focus on meta-analyses, which take into account all the studies published on a particular topic to see what the general trend is. So there's one study, If You Love Me, Keep My Commandments, a meta-analysis of the effects of religion on crime, which looked at 60 individual studies and found that intrinsic religiosity is a deterrent for crime. The average effect size was 0.12. Another study, Religion, Spirituality, and Physical Health in Cancer Patients, a meta-analysis, found religion was associated with the physical health of cancer patients, functional well-being, and improved physical th symptoms. Another, another paper from 1997, the Religious Orientation Scale, Review and Meta-Analysis of the Social Desirability Effects, found intrinsic religiosity, and I quote, tends to correlate with desirable variables, mental health, altruism, religious commitment, and extrinsic religiosity correlates with that which is undesirable, prejudice, non-marital sex. Another study from 2015, Religion, Delinquency, and Drug Use, a meta-analysis found religion had an inverse correlation with delinquency and drug use. Another meta-analysis from 2003, Religiosity and Mental Health, a meta-analysis of recent studies, analyzed 34 studies and found aspects of intrinsic religiosity were associated with better mental health and found strong correlations between religiosity and mental health. 2001, a study titled Religion and Mental Health, Evidence for an Association, surveyed 800 in 50 studies and found that, and I quote, religious involvement is generally associated with greater well-being, less depression and anxiety, greater social support, and less substance abuse. Another meta-analysis, religious priming, a meta-analysis with a focus on pro-sociality, found that religious priming has robust effects across a variety of outcomes, including pro-social effects. 
These studies I just cited are meta-analyses, which again take into account numerous studies which have differing results. They collect the data, do a mathematical analysis to find the general trend, thus making the conclusions far more reliable. Now I swear, I could spend the rest of my time going over study after study after study. There is a wealth of information on this topic by and large that demonstrates that there are positive associations and sometimes causation with intrinsic religiosity. To claim that Christianity is dangerous, one has to tear down all of these studies and present their own studies that argue Christianity as a form of intrinsic religiosity does have dangerous effects. And as far as I can see from the peer-reviewed literature, that claim is scientifically unwarranted. So, as Aaron Ross said in his opening statements of 2018 with George Lujak, my position it is dishonest to assert blind speculations as though they were fact, but that is all religions do, and science is only concerned with what is supported by evidence, and what is not supported by the evidence. And what is not supported by the evidence does not warrant con serious consideration. Come back when you have something to show, and then we'll have something to talk about. So if Aaron wants to suggest Christianity is dangerous, he needs to take his own advice and present uh, data which actually looks at intrinsic religiosity and shows this. Now to be fair, he did cite a couple papers which I have read, one from Gregory Paul, for example. And I will address these towards the end. But when we look at the meta-analytical data, which account for studies that show differing results, not cherry-pick random studies that support your conclusion, the mathematical analyses demonstrate intrinsic religiosity is associated with benef beneficial outcomes in multiple areas. Okay, so remember, the burden is on Aaron to show that Christianity, as a form of intrinsic religiosity, is associated with negative effects. But the scientific data, when you calculate all the studies in, does not confirm this trend. Now I want to move on to look at intelligence and religion, because this is one of Aaron's claims, that religion removes the need for people to think rationally. In his recent debate with Tyler Vela, Aaron noted in his experience, the less religious you are, the more reasonable you are, and that Christianity encourages one to believe without evidence, citing examples like doubting Thomas. I'll get to my opponent's interpretations of various passages later on. But first, I want to address the claim that he's made over the years that Christianity encourages less rational thinking and lowers intelligence. Once again, the, this claim is unwarranted when you dive into the peer-reviewed literature. First, we need to realize measuring intelligence in subjects is extremely hard. This is because you and I might be more intelligent when it comes to philosophy or hermeneutics, but not as intelligent when it comes to auto, mecha auto mechanics or electrical engineering. Intelligence is not really aligned with stupid on one end and genius on the other. In reality, intelligence is more like a web with different, different individuals excelling in different areas. This all means studying intelligence can be quite difficult. Because of this, many researchers try to study and measure different types of intelligence. Uh, a couple types you'll see in the literature, creative intelligence, emotional intelligence, and analytical intelligence. When it comes to emotional intelligence, some studies have found positive associations with religion, specifically Christianity. And this is defined as the ability to understand one's emotions and those of others. Use emotional information to guide thinking and behavior in oneself and others. And adjust one's emotions to adapt to the environment and overcome trials and increase self-mastery. Psychologist Daniel Goldman wrote a whole book called Emotional Intelligence, where he argues this type of intelligence is more hopeful or more helpful than IQ or analytical intelligence. And multiple studies show positive associations with Christianity. Of course, what about rationality or analytical intelligence? Well, we don't have to take Aaron's experience for it or the media. We can study the literature and see if there are any positive associations with intrinsic religiosity and decreased intelligence or decreased rational skills. I'll start with a meta-analysis titled The Relation Between Intelligence and Religiosity by Miriam Zuckerman, which has shown that which has shown up on numerous atheist forums. Because this meta-analysis from a couple of years ago did suggest there is a negative association between analytical intelligence and religiosity. However, we have to remember the golden rule in statistics. Correlation is not causation. In fact, this study that has been so often cited never suggests religion causes lower levels of intelligence. They directly say the present findings are correlational and cannot su support any causal relation. 
Furthermore, this study was heavily criticized by other researchers for significant problems. One study titled, Losing Faith in the Intelligence Religiosity Link, argued that the Zuckerman study suffered from publication bias. It didn't calculate the different sample sizes in, in, in individual studies, didn't distinguish between fixed and random sample sizes, relied too heavily on the fixed sample sizes, and didn't take into account the fact that the negative correlation decreased over time. So in other words, more recent studies displayed far less correlations between religion and lower levels of intelligence. The mathematical data in this later study recalculated Zuckerman's work and these, with these issues in mind and found it was the correlations were significantly weaker. In fact, the correlations were non-significant when they limited themselves to studies conducted after 2010 or they only looked at men. The data also becomes quite fickle when other researchers did a cross-cultural analysis and looked at far less religious cultures versus more significant religious cultures. See analytical atheism, a cross-culturally weak and fickle phenomenon. That's the name of the study. Interestingly, in far less religious countries like the UK and the Czech Republic, and I quote, analytical thinkers were mildly more religious. The researchers went on to suggest this is probably not the case that religion is the cause of lower analytical intelligence, but that people with low analytical skills tend to conform to the cultural norm, whether it is religious or non-religious. This would explain why in countries with higher religiosity, religion correlates with lower analytical thinking, whereas in countries with lower religiosity, it does not correlate with lower analytical thinking. People with lower analytical intelligence just tend to conform to the social norm instead of religion actually playing a causal role. Furthermore, recent studies challenge this, uh, this idea as well. A study from 2017, supernatural belief is not modulated by intuitive thinking or cognitive inhibition. That's the name of the study. They conducted three experiments utilizing different ways to stimulate parts of the brain that correlate with analytical thinking, and in none of them did higher levels of analytical thinking correlate with lower levels of religion. Another study from 2016, primed analytical thought and religiosity, found that, and I quote, analytical thought primes led to higher intrinsic religiosity. And another study from 2017, uh, no evidence that analytical thinking decreases religious belief, which was a reply to a study from 2012, they found no evidence analytical thinking decreased intrinsic religiosity. So basically, what does this all mean? It means the data is fickle. Some studies show analytical thinking correlates with decreased religiosity, some show the opposite, some show no correlation at all, none of them cite a causal factor. So there is, strong e so there is no strong evidence of correlation, let alone causation. In other words, there's no substantial evidence Christianity as a form of intrinsic religiosity lowers intelligence. Now, let me move on to evolution. I'm a theistic evolutionist. Does Christianity cause people to reject evolution? Well, I'm not gonna deny, deny a large percentage of Christians deny and fight against evolution, and this is something I would stand with Aaron on. But once again, correlation is not necessarily causation. For example, the World Health Organization recently noted skepticism of vaccines at this time is at an all-time high in Europe. And this has happened as Europe has become more secular, but it would be stupid and absurd for me to suggest this is a result of secularism. So, this, so to really make my point, let's hone in on some poll data. Pew Research from 2014 showed that 53% of Christians accept evolution. And two groups which were included were Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses, and as every Christian in this room will argue, they're not really Christians but separate religions denying core doctrines. When they're factored out, the number joins up to 57%. So here's my point. If Christianity allegedly causes a rejection of evolution or a strict literal young earth creationism, we should not see these kinds of results manifesting in society, with over half accepting Christianity and evolution. If you told me atheism caused socialism and I checked poll data and found that over half of atheists reject socialism, I would call into question your hypothesis. Correlation, let alone causation, is hard to show when poll data doesn't even show strong correlations. The historian Ronald Numbers wrote a whole book on the origins of modern creationism and notes most of modern creationism goes back to a book from 1961 called The Genesis Flood. The authors basically recycled a bunch of old arguments from George McReady Price, who was a Seventh-day Adventist armchair scientist. Ronald Numbers notes Seventh-day Adventists were one of the only groups in the 19th century that preached strict young earth creationism. You had to be a young earth creationist if you were a Seventh-day Adventist. Because of their alleged prophetess, Ellen G. White, she claimed she had visions of the creation and the global flood taking place. So the movement caused much of the young earth creationist's ideas, which seeped in the mainstream Christianity after 1960s. And this explanation would account for why there's no strong correlation in the poll data. Literal interpretations of Genesis were not an essential part of Christianity, but an essential part of Seventh-day Adventism. 
Early church fathers, Arrhenius, Justin Martyr, Augustine, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, long before the theory of evolution came onto the scene, even advanced allegor inter allegorical interpretations of Genesis 1 and 2. Because of this historical and poll data, it's hard to claim literal interpretations of Genesis are essential to Christianity. And therefore, you'd be hard pressed to show Christianity necessarily causes a rejection of evolution. So far, I've argued there's no strong empirical data Christianity causes dangerous or harmful results. And there are studies which show beneficial associations with intrinsic religiosity. There are no polls which support Oren's conclusions that the majority of Christians have to accept his interpretations of scripture. And there are no uh, polls which show the majority of Christians have belief faith means you must reject evidence and rationality. Now, Oren thinks this is what the Bible teaches. And he has a video. And in his video titled, How Religion Harms Education, he says, faith is an assertion of unreasonable conviction that is assumed without reason and defended against all reason. Now, I don't know his source for this definition because he doesn't provide one in there, but there are numerous problems with this. First, faith in the Bible is the Greek word pistis, and I can find no scholar that specializes in coining a Greek who says this is what the Bible teaches. Dr. Leon Morris, in the Dictionary of Paul and His Letters, says faith is understood more or less as a response to revelation, not something one uses to get to Christianity. And he says faith is, means commitment or assurance, not blind belief. This can be seen in places like Acts 17.31. If you read the English, it doesn't say the word faith. You, you'll read, he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance, pistis, to all by raising him from the dead. Or 1 Peter 1, 6 to 7, the tested genuineness of your pistis, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire. Faith does not mean rejecting evidence or reason. It means being committed to Christ, which is the same as what it means when someone says they're faithful to their spouse. It doesn't mean they blindly accept everything their spouse says or does. It means they're committed. How they rationally got to that commitment or faith can be different, but it is absurd and unscholarly to find pistis as an unreasonable conviction. If that is what faith is, then I challenge anyone to provide a scholar who specializes in ancient Greek literature who says this is what the Greek word pistis means. Now, when it comes to doubting Thomas, this is taken out of context as expected. Thomas was never asked to believe without evidence. He was stubborn in the face of sufficient evidence. Remember the context. Thomas had the evidence of the empty tomb and numerous close friends corroborating the same story. Thomas doubted in spite of evidence. Jesus never said believe on no evidence. He taught in places like John 14, 11 to believe on the sufficient evidence he had already provided. Thomas had enough evidence and still rejected the truth, so he was not as blessed as those who believe without being forced to accept the truth. A similar idea can be seen in Hebrews 11, which is often taken out of context. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So surely faith must mean a lack of evidence? Well, the immediate context should be enough to debunk this misunderstanding. The verse contains parallelism. Things not seen is meant to parallel things hoped for. So it should be clear faith in this verse means trust in God and that he, that he will fulfill his promises. Look at the examples that follow, which are meant to clarify the statement. All the people living were given evidence to trust God in the promises that he made. In other words, they were given evidence to place their faith, assurance, loyalty in God for the things that hope for and thereby do the things he commanded. Verse 19 even says Abraham had faith or trusted in God because he used his reason to realize God could bring Isaac back, from, back to life and fulfill his promise. The Greek word is actually a derivative or, or an earlier form of what we get the word logic from. Now, there are plenty of other verses my opponent has quote minded over the years. I have a video on my channel titled, Is Faith Blind?, which addresses a lot of them and provides other verses that encourage Christians to use their reason. All in all, uh, Aaron has constantly assumed this definition uh, and I have seen no data that this is what actually is taught within ancient Greek literature. On top of that, I have a full word analysis. I looked up how the Greek word is used in Herodotus, Diodorus, Aristotle, Xenophon, Plato, and many other ancient Greek works. And it is never used to mean an act of denying evidence or rejecting reason. It is constantly used by early authors like Aristotle to constantly refer to loyalty or confidence or a pledge. If Aaron wants to tell us faith means denying reason, then he then why is it never used that way in the early Greek sources? So as far as I can find, and I could be wrong on this, but the definition that faith is the belief without evidence came from a satirical dictionary called the Devil's Dictionary, written by a Civil War soldier, Ambrose Bierce. 
How about Old Testament verses? Do, don't Christians constantly ignore that? I have tattoos. The first and most obvious problem is this is confusing prescriptive verses with descriptive verses. Many of the verses from the Old Testament are not prescribed to Christians, and this can be demonstrated in four easy, easy steps. In Matthew 5, Jesus says he came to fulfill the law and that it will pass away once all is fulfilled. Step two, John 19 says when Jesus bowed his head, he said it is finished to fulfill the scriptures. Hebrews 8 says because of this, the law is passing away and obsolete. And, John, and in John 15, and Paul in Galatians 5 says what Christians are now commanded to do is to love one another and love thy neighbor. So Old Testament laws are not prescribed to Christians. So Christians, when I'm asked if I keep any of the Ten, ten Commandments, I say no. Because all those were fulfilled in Christ, and instead I'm called to keep the royal law of Christ. There is overlap, for sure. Just like there is overlap between your old rent agreement and your new rent agreement. But you don't follow the rules of your old rent agreement in your new apartment. Likewise, some laws are restated in the new covenant, like love thy neighbor. But that doesn't mean it's exactly the same covenant as the old. Now, I wanted to address some of these studies, so I left myself some time at the end. Uh, so he cites a, a cult, cross-cultural analysis of saying that more secular countries have better results. This is a paper by a paleontologist named Gregory Paul, and I've seen Mark Zuck, or I'm sorry, Phil Zuckerman cite this as well. Okay, I want to be clear. I'm using an analogy here. I'm not accusing RN of anything in this analogy except comparing types of reasoning. Unfortunately, this is the same data I see when I've debated white supremacists. They'll go, look at how much better Europe is and look at how bad Africa is. Therefore, whiteness causes it. That's a bad argument. We, don't, we have to do multivariate analysis of people in these countries. That's important. You just can't do what Paul did, do a univariate analysis of cross-country data. That's not a good argument. For, and plus, so for example, other studies, when you look at this, uh, where is it? So for example, crime and religion, an international comparison among 13 industrial nations found at the individual level, at the individual level of analysis, evidence has accumulated in support of the hypothesis that persons who are most religious commit crimes at lower rates than those who are least religious. And this would correlate to the meta-analysis I cited earlier that says religion deters crime. So uh, Phil Zuckerman does a lot of this in his paper from 2009 where he cites these cross-cultural analysis. The problem is that's not good reasoning. We gotta look at intrinsic religiosity studied in actual subjects. And by and large, it shows very good results. Now real quick, I wanna know the differences because I wanna uh, preempt a possible argument. What's the difference between intrinsic religiosity and extrinsic religiosity? This shows up in the literature a lot. Psychologists going back to the 60s wanted to distinguish different types of religiosity. Intrinsic religiosity is to find persons with orientation find their master motive in religion. Other needs, strong as they may be, are regarded as less of an ultimate significance, and they are, so far as possible, brought into harmony with the religious beliefs and prescriptions. In other words, intrinsic religiosity means you hold to the core tenets of the religion. That's why you're religious. You want to believe in the core tenets of Christianity. That's your motivation. Extrinsic religiosity is defined as using religion as a means to an end. You use religion to make yourself more moral or to be part of a fun social group or just to fit in with your culture. You use religion as a means to an end. That is always associated with negative effects. Whereas intrinsic religiosity, what is studied in the literature, is by and large associated with very positive effects. So we need to keep that in mind going forward. Other terms that show up in the lit literature are like things like quest orientation, religious fundamentalism, distinct from intrinsic religiosity, and sometimes we'll even include uh, Christian orthodoxy, which can overlap different parts in there. So we need to keep that in mind. Uh, furthermore, one of the studies I cited or earlier, the religious orientation scale, uh, notes that uh, in extrinsic religiosity scale does a good job, or I'm sorry, extrinsic religiosity does a good job of measuring the sort of religion that gives religion a bad name. So a lot of the effects we see in society that some people like to attribute to religion, in the, met, in the meta-analysis peer-reviewed data, that's most likely attributed to extrinsic religiosity, not actually intrinsic religiosity. And Christianity, by definition, would have to be a form of intrinsic religiosity. So that's also to remember. Now let's, I want to also address one more thing, climate change. Does Christianity cause a rejection of climate change? Well, no, Yale University, uh, a program called Climate Change Communication, did a poll and found that Catholics, 69%, accept anthropogenic climate change, Protestants, 62%, and even evangelicals, 51%, accept. Okay, so 
if Christianity somehow causes this, I want to see a study showing intrinsic religiosity causes people to reject environment, environmental policies or whatever. Plus, there was a study called Political Conservatism, Religion and Environmental Consumption in the United States. They found the strength of religious identity and, regu and regularity of religious attendance appeared to increase environmentally friendly consumer behavior. To quote directly, we can assert there is no evidence that any of our measures of religiosity intensify the negative political conservative effect, which they defined as being against environmental policies. So we need to look at the actual data. So going back to my original point, Arne has chosen to debate the positive position tonight that Christianity is dangerous. I don't know why he would agree to that. I certainly would not agree to a debate to claim that atheism is dangerous because I know the literature very well. But if Aaron wants us to think Christianity is dangerous, he needs to provide sufficient peer-reviewed data, preferably in the form of a meta-analysis, which, which demonstrates negative associations of intrinsic religiosity. Then he has to provide a reasonable link that Christianity can be the cause of this I've contested this cannot be done, and it is, in, is scientifically inaccurate to say Christianity as a form of intrinsic religiosity is dangerous, especially when the overwhelming amount of research notes positive associations. Now, Aaron has said that if he is presented with new data, he will change his mind. So luckily, I printed out most of the studies <laughs> that I cited tonight, and I didn't have time to print them all out because I ran out of paper. So to quote him from one of his videos on March 1st, 2018, that is what reasonable people do. And that is why they say truth hurts and it is inconvenient and that the facts are cold and hard. The truth may set you free, but it might first piss you off. <laughs> so if Aaron wants to be set free, he can have this stack and this book I brought for him, which debunks a lot of myths in the atheist community and myths in creationist community, so he probably will like some of the chapters. So he can take the stack with home, with home with him and he can read from the experts himself. He doesn't have to take my word for it. With that, I'll yield the rest of my time. We will now uh, segue to cross-examination. Each speaker will have 15 minutes to question the other. I will give notice at the five minute and two minute mark. Um, after that, short 10 minute break where you will throw a lot of money at the bar. And then we will have a Q and A start over here. All right, so what I got out of your presentation was that the best that you could offer was a placebo effect, that if somebody had this belief that, that, that having the belief wouldn't necessarily harm them, which uh, I have huge issues with. But we note that uh, Christianity, obviously, by my presentation, doesn't show that, that, that it prevents Christians from behaving badly. That Clearly, that has failed, right? And there's nothing about the value of truth in the belief, right? There's no, there's like, there doesn't have to be any validity yet at all, which is a huge issue for me. I will have to wonder, how is it not dangerous to believe in the concept of a scapegoat or original sin or a global flood that we know never happened, any of that? Well, how is that not dangerous? Well, you'd have to show studies showing those specific beliefs actually cause these dangerous effects. I just can't go, oh, well, your interpretation is enough to show that. I don't know what else to do. I want to go off on what the science says. Okay, well, and, and of course I do too. I mean, you know, we, we, and, um, uh, Daniel Dennett, thank you. Uh, and Daniel Dennett is uh, running the, um, I think it, maybe it's his wife, Linda Lascola, that's running the clergy project. Are you familiar with it? Uh, vaguely, you should probably okay, remind so this me. Is, this is where pastors who have spent their lives making a living as pastors realize that they don't believe their own nonsense anymore. <laughs> and one of the trends that was recognized from that was that they tend to be less, when they realize that they no longer believe, they come out of belief, the trend is that they, they no longer are as judgmental. They are much more tolerant. They're much more liberal. They change the way that they vote. They no longer hate gays, for example. <laughs> Yeah. You know, so, so, how does uh, I, I, uh, how does um, I'm trying to formulate this this question on the fly? How does believing things that are not evidently true, which is the basis of faith, not dangerous? Again, I don't. I can't psychoanalyze all those pastors. I would need to. Uh, have a study done, are they extrinsically religious? Are they Christian fundamentalists? I'm sorry, religious fundamentalists is the term used in the studies. Are they intrinsic? Just saying, look, this is the way it perceives to me, or this is the way it perceives to Dan Dennett's wife, is not enough to actually show 
that's what's happening. Correlation is not causation. I need to see actual data that intrinsic religiosity increases uh, bad ethical behavior or lowers intelligence or increases these bad beliefs, you think. Well, we, we did uh, give a whole bunch of examples of this, right? And this is specific mm -hmm. to Christianity. Of course, this is all religions that have the same problem. And they all claim to have the absolute truth when none of them have any actual truth to them at all. You know, and, and one of the, the biggest issues that I have with, re, with religious people is that they always, for some reason that I've still never figured out, they always think that belief in the existence of God somehow dictates morality even though the scriptures doesn't support that at all. I mean, the, the way that we are judged is not over whether we are good or bad, because you know, we, we, if we are evil, then according to the Bible, then, then we are gonna be punished in this life, not in the next one. What we are judged for exclusively is whether we believe. It doesn't matter how evil you are, all your sins can be forgiven if you but believe. But if you don't believe, then it doesn't matter how good you are, because the only sin that cannot be forgiven is the sin of disbelief. You are judged for your gullibility exclusively, and you are not given evidence. You're given, as I said before, you're given uh, you know, authority claims, right? You're given that you have to believe the Bible or, or else, but you are not given evidence to indicate that, and you are forbidden to consider evidence to the contrary. Is there a question in there? I thought that was. Well, you didn't end with the question. Well, how, is it not, how is it not dangerous, given that you have to believe this no matter what? Okay, well, you cited a couple things in there. A, your interpretation. A, in your experience, this is what you see. I would just reply, is your experience somehow evidence? I need to see actual data that, that what you think this interpretation, as I noted in my presentation, causes is interpreted that way. So you take this Bible verse and you say, well, it means this. And then all Christians also accept this, and it says dangerous effects. All those are leaps in logic. You gotta show me your interpretation is the only necessary reading. Uh, and then you gotta show that most Christians ex agree with you on this, and that has dangerous effects when studied. Well, Dan Barker, for example, who was a missionary for many years, uh, you know, traveling internationally, you know, bringing the word of God and so forth, he was the one that wrote that, that, that faith is a cop-out, that if you have to believe something on faith, it means that, you, you, that it's not based on evidence. Right, so they, 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 we've gotten quotes like this from many people who used to believe once they realize how vacuous that actually is and every Christian I've ever debated this with tells me that I'm misdefining faith and that's why I would say okay well what is the evidence the scientific evidence that that prompted you to believe as you do never once has any of them ever produced a thing so where is the where is the positive attribute since there's no evident truth to the belief system. This goes back to the first question I asked you in this interrogation. Where is, where is the value of truth in the belief system? Okay, well, you, it sounds like it's question making. You're assuming, you know, your standard of evidence, you're assuming that somehow that you, your worldview is already true. Uh, that's not the debate tonight. The debate is, is Christianity dangerous? So even mm -hmm. if Christianity is wrong, that doesn't necessarily mean it manifests in dangerous so ways. It's, it's not wrong to believe in something that is not evidently true. I didn't say that. So, you Are you to, saying that? T tell me, yes or say, no. Is that, say the question again. Is it wrong to believe in something that is not evidently true? Define evidently, because that sounds like an evidential. supported by evidence. See, I can't believe something unless it is supported by evidence. Right, I would agree. I, I wouldn't believe something unless I'm convinced by it. I right? would agree. And then there has to be evidence to convince me. I can't take because I said so or because you'll go to hell if you don't believe this. I would agree. Okay. So with, with uh, Christianity, you are required to believe in a handful of things, just a small number of things that are not supported by any evidence at all. And that's the thing that you're being judged for. So how is that not dangerous, especially? when it comes to your evaluation or your analysis of data. If you're not allowed to consider data, you're only allowed to believe what you're told on faith. Hey, a couple things there. Uh, it doesn't say we're not allowed to consider data. I don't see a verse indicating that. And again, I would send this as sort of question making. You're assuming it's already false, therefore it's bad, therefore it's dangerous. That's not the debate we're having tonight if it's true or not. We're having a debate, is it dangerous? So for example, uh, Ptolemaic astronomy, we both reject. It's a bad argument, but it was useful for navigation. So something can be pragmatic and not true. Something can be true and not pragmatic. That's what the debate I was understanding we were having tonight. That's why I focus on the actual studies. I didn't present arguments for Christianity. If you want to have that debate, I'm sure James would like to host it in the back. Yeah, uh, I'm not interested in a debate promoting Christianity either, but heresy, apostasy, and uh, blasphemy, 
right? These are all variations from what you've been told to believe. If you deviate from that or if you don't buy it at all, these are all damnable, right? These are, these are capital crimes for which in many countries and throughout most of history you could be murdered if you subscribe to any one of them. If you, if you had a different opinion or a different interpretation, that's heresy, right? If you didn't believe it at all, that if you no longer believed it, that was apostasy. And if you, if you decided, you know what, I don't buy this anymore, that's blasphemy. You can be killed for any of those. How is that not dangerous? I never said it wasn't, but I want to see that intrinsic religiosity is directly so causing what, it. If, if, if you want to argue that, that Christianity is not dangerous, then, then how, how is it not dangerous? You have a required belief system, and I, I can go through a list of other things, but you said that, that, that none of my examples of, how, of what Christianity leading to, the, the teachings of Christianity, the scriptures implying what believers have to do if they believe in the scriptures, you discounted all those because that's just bad people doing bad things. But if you have the belief system, what, what about that is not dangerous? Okay, well, I didn't just discount it. I gave studies showing that the correlations just aren't there and the causation is not just there. No, so, you, you said that all of the people that I had listed, all of the atrocities that have gone down in the name of Christ by Christian leaders and by main, main denominations and so forth were all just, just Christians acting badly. Obviously, Christianity doesn't prevent people from acting badly. And it, and it does indeed, as you admitted yourself in your own presentation, it does prompt a lot of people to reject science, to reject rationalism, to not be able to consider their own, their own perspectives or the evidence. They can't discuss any of this rationally because they're upholding that they have to believe something. And if you have to believe something, how, and, and, and you're going to be damned forever, and the Bible's explicit about this, you have to believe exactly what it tells you for no reason or you're going to be damned. Where does it say for no reason? When it says that it has to be believed on faith. And, and so we have the defined? story. We have the story of Thomas. Well, Thomas looked for, for evidence and he was given evidence. So we're all supposed to accept that, oh, well, Thomas looked for evidence and there was evidence. So if it was enough to satisfy Thomas, then it was enough to satisfy me. But it's not. Where does the Bible say that we're just supposed to believe Thomas's word? Nowhere does it say, and nor did I imply, that we were supposed to believe Thomas's word as Thomas is not likely a real character. <laughs> He says, there's a question there? That, yeah, I, you skipped the question to ask another one of your own. So what's the question? Okay. How is it not dangerous to be required to believe something even when the evidence says otherwise? I would say that's question begging. You're assuming the evidence doesn't lead to Christianity. This is what my whole channel is for, is showing the evidence. Now, even if that is false, that doesn't show that it is dangerous. The numerous studies done don't show those results. So I don't know where you're getting this Again, data from. Again, we're not, we're not getting to the truth of the, of the value of the belief. Okay, you're saying that you have the police placebo effect, that, that if people, and we're just assuming that your studies are true, because the, the thing that I found interesting about you was that the studies I cite show exactly the same, the opposite of the studies that you cite. And the other studies that I didn't cite also show the opposite of I what you cite. I've read a lot of the studies. Well, so what we, what? I've read a lot of the studies you cite. Like you cited the one on child abuse. That was a self-reported measure of 111 inmates. It didn't calculate any sort of uh, data. It didn't have them perform any tests. It didn't it distinguish was a, It was a study of 111 inmates that didn't require any data. No, it was a survey, basically. I looked at it. Okay. I saw you cited it in some of your videos. The video from so March how is 11? that not data? I mean, I'm sorry, that's, that's, that's not even in the line of question. Self-reported measure. Okay, so where is the value then? Right, because if if you're going to be if you're going to be damned on on what you believe, and so we're now we're controlling what people think, and the Ten Commandments, I'm sure you will agree, is all about controlling what people think, because you are going to be damned over you know whether you believe something. I mean, it doesn't you know it doesn't doesn't matter what you believe if you're talking to people, but God. God's going to damn you over what you believe, not whether you're a good person or a bad person. So that has nothing to do with it. It has nothing to do with our morality. And most people object to the biblical morality anyway. They would not live out what the Bible says that they're supposed to do. So how is Christianity not dangerous? If you're following it to the letter, then you're a fundamentalist, and the fundamentalists are the most dangerous form of Christians, right? That's not how religious fundamentalism is defined in these studies. It's actually different than intrinsic religiosity. It's defined more as like a radical view. Uh, you're specifically using religion for a lot of political type ideas as a response to modernism. That's why they distinguish it from between intrinsic religiosity or Christian orthodoxy. So these are actually distinct measures. So for example, in the studies, prejudice isn't defined even how we would define it in like the media. It's actually a less harsh term. You know, look for terms like uh, discriminatory attitudes from our, the more harsh type thing. So 
let's not commit an etymological fallacy. Fundamentalism doesn't mean you hold to the fundamentals of a religion. That's a cultural term that more or less means these radicals over there. It, we can't just define things based on word parts. We've got to define how it actually is defined in psychology or in the dictionary even. And fundamentalism in society does not mean I hold to all the fundamentals of Christianity. It's a radical type view that has generally been associated with that. So in every interpretation, and a lot of my questions ha here had to do with the way that people, inter the way that Christians interpret the scriptures, what they're supposed to believe and what they think is supposed to be moral and this is the way they're being judged by God. All of this is negated pretty much by, by you saying that it's just Christians acting badly and this is, and this no. is a, a problem with interpretation perhaps. No, my, my uh, argument that it isn't is the actual studies don't show that. The studies don't show their bad behavior is a cause of their intrinsic religiosity. But their bad behavior is based on scripture. So, they, everyone, so then, every bad person can make okay, an excuse. So if the reasons that they're citing for their bad behavior is the righteous justification that they get from the scriptures of what they're told they're supposed to do by this God they believe in. Let me ask you this, if someone in 20 years saw this debate and you were arguing Christianity was dangerous and they took your words to go out and say, well, this means we should kill them before they kill us. Would that mean you caused that just because he used your words to justify his bad actions? I don't think so and I wouldn't accuse you of that. You obviously didn't say that. People can, bad people use whatever they want to to justify it. That doesn't mean, as the studies show, that the intrinsic religiosity is the cause. So for example, what are the interpretations that we're talking about where, where Jesus says that he is gonna return very soon, right? while some of his disciples are still alive. Some, but not all of them, and that's an important distinction for a lot of the anti, the, the apologetics that I've heard. So people in, will complain, and I've met people who wouldn't mow their lawns or repair you know, damage to their houses because Jesus is coming back very soon, right? How is that not dangerous? If you think that, that you think that, that you, you're, gonna, you're electing people who are, who are judges and, and sovereigns over your situation when they've already judged your situation how and their dominionists, they are their end times dominionists. They think that you don't have a future. How is that not dangerous? Well, I want to note first, I'm a preterist, so I don't agree with a lot of these right, people. What? I'm a preterist, partial preterist, post millennialist. Uh, for one, their misunderstanding does not mean the belief actually caused it. If someone misunderstood humanism, like the Jacobins who called themselves humanists to do all these horrible things during the French Revolution, that doesn't mean humanism caused it. It means their misunderstanding, their bad behavior, trying to justify anything they can. So is I what caused it. I have quite a list here of, of atrocities that are being visited against American politics, against the environment, against the economy, against every, every virtually every aspect of life that is being caused by religious beliefs. But all of that is negated because they're interpreting it wrong? What? All right. Answer the last question. Say that again. I said, so you're, you're, you're saying that all of the, my, I've got a long list uh, of people. Yeah, of, they're of, in, they're trying to justify their bad behavior by misinterpreting scripture and finding whatever they possibly can to justify what they already so want to do. So everything is just a misinterpretation, Every, even when the Bible is explicit about it. Yeah, because you have to show it in the actual studies that this causes it. The so, actual studies. Uh, I've got a, I have questions I mean, for how you. How do we have an actual study of an interpretation of scripture? I got questions for you. Okay. 15 minutes. All right. Five and two. All right. Do you have any scholars that specialize in Koine Greek to say pistis means denying evidence or reason? Scholars who say that, that say again? Pistis, the uh, Greek word we translate as faith, means denying evidence or reason. And we have demonstrations of that. Do we have any scholars that say this is how it's defined? I have no idea if we have scholars okay, that so say that. We, well, no. I know that we have missionaries who say that that is what it okay, is. Okay, are they experts? We have, well, I'm sorry, are what? they the experts, though? I don't know. Okay, fair enough. But as, as I said, what I've demonstrated myself is whenever I've talked about, okay, so your, your faith is based on uh, arguments from authority, or your faith is, ba faith is based on a subjective impression, but it's, it's based on anything but scientific evidence, because that's the one thing we never have that supports faith. And they say, well, you're wrong. We have that. Okay, well, what is your scientific evidence? Never once has a Christian ever given that. Okay. Uh, how is the word pistis defined in Aristotle, Antiphon, Diodorus, Plato? Have you looked into that at all? No, I haven't looked into how Aristotle okay, interpreted so that, then, no. Have you done a good analysis of what the word actually means in the New Testament then, if you don't actually look at the Greek word? 
I've, yeah, in the context of the New Testament, yes. How so? You know, it, well, see, Jesus tells his followers that if you had the faith of the mustard seed, that you could tell that mountain to go jump into the sea, and it would be done. You would be able to do greater things than I have done if you had any faith at all. But then, of course... It's an impossible standard because any time they can't make, they can't, any time they can't tell the mountain to jump into the ocean and it jumps into the ocean, it's because they didn't have enough faith. And so this is an impossible marker that they have to live up to. But it still means that they're supposed to believe that and they're supposed to be absolutely convinced of it. And again, it's not about evidence. Blessed is he who has not seen and yet believed. Uh, does Jesus always, is he always literal? No. Yeah, exactly. Um, so now, now we have the argument of it's medical, it's metaphorical, except when it's literal, and every time you get a challenge on it, well, then it's not literal there, it's metaphorical there. It's called hermeneutics. Another question. Um, so uh, if I was a medical doctor and I told you you had cancer, and you said, well, I don't feel any different, I don't look like I have cancer, and I said, walk by faith or trust in the medical advice, not by what you see. Would that mean you were denying evidence if you took, if you put your faith in my medical advice? Don't confuse faith with trust. It's an equivocation that is particularly annoying to me. Okay, because so... Because faith means a belief that is not based on evidence, and it does not mean trust. We have, to, we have two contexts in the dictionary. We have one that is just a synonym of trust, and I don't use that because I don't want to confuse people. And then we have the religious context, which is a belief that is not based on evidence. Okay, so where is it defined that way? And, and even... even uh, Oh, I can't remember the, the names of the, the right off the top of my head. Uh, Martin Luther, for example, went on and on about how reason and faith were at odds with each other. So, yeah, th there's a consistent theme that we don't have scientific evidence that backs up faith. You just believe it because you're told to was because you want to, but not because it is not because it is indi to indicated to you in such a degree that you had to change your mind, even if you didn't want okay, so to. That's back, not that's going not back to my question, first. though. What's that? If I told, going back to my question, if I just told you, walk by faith in the medical advice, not by what you see, would that mean you were denying evidence if you did? I was denying a claim. Okay. So, so I went and got a second and then a third opinion. But does that mean that walk by faith, not by sight, means you're denying evidence, though, based on that logic? No. I'm looking for evidence. I have a claim. I want to check the claim. So I'm getting a second opinion. If, they are, if there's an association there, and I think the two might be working together, I had to go to an independent source Good. Who, who can then show me the data independently of either of the other two to show that, yeah, this is actually the thing. Okay, well, you, I guess you got me. So you would agree that walking by faith, not by sight, does not mean rejecting evidence? No, I I'm absolutely right. would not believe, I'd agree with that. I would completely oppose that. But if I say just add walk by faith in the medical device, not by what you see, then all of a sudden it just means trust. What? So if I said, like my example, walk mm -hmm. by faith, not by sight in the medical device, there it means trust. But when in the New Testament, so using we're, the same arguing, language. Well, I'm, su I'm suggesting that you should use skepticism rather than just believing the first thing that you're told. And you're trying to turn that around, that the first thing you're told is something that, that we should believe. Or if you don't believe it, well, then that's somehow faith because you're checking it on other sources. No, we're, we're, you're contradicting now. No, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just asking, is the phrase alone, if you heard it from a doctor, mean you're rejecting evidence? Yes. So if a doctor is telling me to walk by faith rather than sight, yes, that's rejecting evidence. Okay. Okay, so why though? Why because he's telling me to walk by faith rather than sight. But if I add in the medical advice after faith, then it's What okay. medical advice is there if he can't back it up? Well, he gives the evidence, and what then he evidence? says have faith in this evidence. He's not asking me to have trust in the evidence that he can produce. If he has evidence, I don't need faith. I can trust, not faith, trust in the evidence produced. And then if I'm feeling extra skeptical, I will go to other sources, but I will not have faith slash trust until I can show verification. And I don't call trust faith. Faith is a belief that is not based on evidence. Trust is what I have in evidence. Okay, well, I don't accept that definition of faith, and I don't All see right, it. then we can talk for a long time about the evidence that didn't drive you to your current conclusion. Okay, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Every time I've ever talked to a Christian about what scientific evidence led them to their conclusion, they haven't been able to produce any. You will be no different. Okay, well, that's sort of begging the question, assuming basically a dogmatic Well, we can belief. have a long conversation. We've both got YouTube channels. We can arrange this, it's but kind you of, won't have it. It's kind of interesting. There was a study that came out called Our Atheist Undogmatic, and then self-reported measures. They noted that the atheists claimed they were less dogmatic, but when actual studies were done, they were quite biased and closed-minded to other beliefs. Well, I am not biased. 
And you can test that. Well, I will go on the studies, not your word. I'm going on probability. Is your personal experience based on... I've spent 20 years as an atheist activist. I've had this exact argument every week for the last 20 years. Not once has it varied. I'm sticking with the probability that you're not going to vary from that either. I got a question about some of the studies you cited. You cited the one that looked at all the different countries. Uh, Who's the author of that? I don't remember, but I do have citations that uh, are, in, are in the system. I can look it up. It'll take a minute. Is he Gregory Paul? G- Gregory Paul was one of the studies, yes. but that's not the citations that I'm looking for. Okay, so one of the studies you did mention was a paper by Gregory Paul. That was by... based on other ones. It, well, n- not really. He, did a cro- he did basically did a univariate analysis, visual inspection, fails normal probability test, and it, at best it's one study. Do you think that would counter a, stu- a meta-analysis that incorporates 60 studies? I wouldn't say that one study counters multiple studies. No, I wouldn't say that. Okay, so then do you have any evidence... In that counters the evidence I presented that intrinsic religiosity leads to like harmful effects. I think I actually do. Such as? What, the, the, the nations that we know of to be more secular now have higher rates of human rights, whereas the more fundamentalist states, the more invested in their religious or their religiosity are worse. And this, is, this actually is demonstrably true even in areas of the United States. Look at Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, right? Those are the only three countries that Texas can point to and say, ha ha. You mean states, right? Yeah, you're right. I meant states. Yeah, no worries. Uh, so, but what about when we look in those, those actual people in them, in those states or in those countries, and it shows their intrinsic religi- religiosity is associated with benefit, benefit outcomes? Could it be maybe just looking at cross-state data is just correlation, not causation? What is the possible benefit of believing something that isn't evidently true? Again, you're assuming it's not true. I'm assuming it's not evidently true. Well, that's not even assuming. I know that it's not evidently true. What is the benefit of believing that? Okay, you again, you're just question making. You're assuming it's not true and therefore it's bad. I said not evidently true. Because after 20 years of research, I've never seen evidence. Okay. You don't have it, then we're done. Is your personal experience evidence against the, the peer reviewed studies? If, if we're talking about probabilities, Against what you're arguing, yes. So your personal experience with religious people Mm -hmm. is better than the studies I cited. So 20 years of not gotten a single Christian to provide scientific evidence for their belief system, and neither can you, verifies yes. You're sticking with the probability. Okay, so your personal experience, again, I just want to make sure we're, is better than the studies I've presented, that intrinsic religiosity is bad. No, I started this saying you've cited a placebo effect that some people can get some what sort of... What study shows this is a placebo effect? All of them? The one you were mentioning? Uh, none of them say that. Okay, I know that you didn't interpret it that way. But you're talking about people who way. have a belief, who have this belief system, somehow feel better about it some, some way, or they think they're... Which is a weird thing, because the Bible and the Scriptures do not support that God judges morality at all, but people think that it does, erroneously. And so I grant that some people think... A lot of, a lot of people think that God is judging them on their morality, even though the Scriptures do not say that at all. So it's a misinterpretation on... Their part, not mine, that they think that they're going to be judged on whether they're good or bad people. That's an interesting thing that they do that. Okay, and it also isn't consistent. You would agree, though, even if you're right in this interpretation, that does not show Christianity is dangerous, though, because the yes, studies it don't absolutely show it. would. Okay, so because where's the it's, effects? It's defying your ability to reason because you have to believe this and you can't counter it. What study shows that intrinsic religiosity decreases rationality or analytical intelligence? Bye. I'm not aware that there's any study that says that intrinsic religiosity increases rationality. I gave one. Okay. You cited one on the fly that I have not seen. So excuse me for not taking your word for it. Um, So in your debate, okay, so in your debate with Ken Hovind in in round two, part one at 738, you correctly pointed out that Ken Hovind doesn't understand evolution. And then you said, and I quote, being in your career for this long, you have no excuse for not knowing this subject any better. How long have you been an atheist activist and you don't know a lot of these studies that I cited from like the 90s? How long have, I've been an atheist activist since before the study you're talking about came out. Okay, so. so, And that's the one that you're citing. So you're you're criticizing me for not knowing, the thing, the singular thing that you brought up after my 20 years of experience, and that you haven't countered that 20 years of experience because you still don't have that physical evidence. I am still absolutely correct in saying that your belief system is not evidently true. That's not the debate tonight. The debate is, is Christianity dangerous? I want to know. Yes. You've been so saying this. Nobody can determine the truth 
of the belief system, everybody, all of the criminality that I have listed in my system, and I have a lot of lists here, or I have a list of a lot of examples, all of this criminality and other sort of distortions, all of this madness and insanity that is based on people's interpretations of scripture, this is large groups of Christian denominations and so forth, all of that is based on people acting badly or people misinterpreting scripture. Where is there a value in believing in it at all? What data shows that their interpretations causes the bad behavior? Where's the data that shows their intrinsic religiosity causes the bad behavior? I can give specifics for each one that I list. In a peer-reviewed study? In a peer-reviewed study? Uh, if, if, if necessary, yes. Sure, go ahead. But it'll, I won't be able to pull that up at the moment. Are you talking I, about the one where you talk about the uh, child molesters, or sometimes you talk about a study of uh, attentional blame? Uh, for example, 20 to 40 percent of America's homeless youth were disavowed from their Christian parents because they identified as gay or trans. How can we prevent this sort of family division and estrangement based on religious prejudice, uh, for example? You, I can produce peer-reviewed studies that show 20 to 40 percent of America's homeless youth are gay or trans, and that's why they're homeless, because their parents were Christian. Are you aware of a study called Religion, Religiosity, and the Attitudes Towards Homosexuality, a multi-analysis of 79 countries? No, I'm not. Does, okay. that, does that alter the fact of what I just said? Yeah, because, for example, they say... Uh, so you're example, saying that it's not 20 to 40 percent of I'm America's arguing. youth, nor for that reason? I'm arguing there's no evidence there intrinsic religiosity is necessarily the cause. 20 to 40 percent of people that are estranged from their Christian families because they're gay or trans and they're and, and you're saying that that's not the reason. What data shows it's their religion that causes it, not their misinterpretations or looking for an excuse to do something. So this study I was talking about, they note, uh, for example, in communist. Okay, so for example, they say these results on religion and religiosity are in line with the claim of Gordon Alport, who stated that the role of religion is paradoxical when dealing with homosexuals. They even noted in communist and post communist countries an increase in religiosity led to a less strong rise in homo negativity. So, if the religiosity is causing these negative results, why is it not correlating with the data done in peer reviewed literature? Isn't it? It's not. There are some studies that do argue that, but they don't ever argue a causal factor. I know I've looked. So uh, I watched a few minutes of one of your other presentations, and I was surprised to find that you cite data that is exactly opposite of the data that I would cite. I, I, I was not really surprised at that, I guess, would be fair to say, because I knew you would have to. I don't see where you're coming from here. I don't see a defense of the belief system where Christianity, the idea that you have to believe that somebody died for your sins, which is a scapegoat excuse, and how this is supposed to, your belief in that, not the actions that you actually commit, but your belief in that is somehow supposed to judge you for eternal damnation or eternal salvation. No, there's no benefit here. I'm looking Let, for, and I know you're going to say, well, where is the peer-reviewed study no, that says that the Bible say. says that, but that's the Bible not, says that. That's not what I'm going to say. I'm going to say there is no evidence that that belief, A, is the correct interpretation, let alone causes Christianity there's to be no dangerous. That, there's no peer-reviewed study that says it's not the correct interpretation either. That's the problem with interpreting scriptures. Everybody makes up whatever they want it to say. Okay, that doesn't show that it's dangerous, though. It shows that... It does. I've shown a huge list, and, and I haven't gone into it because I have, a, I have a much longer list than I was able to give in this, but it does show that, that people will commit all kinds of atrocities in the name of what they think they're God is saying, and, and you're saying that they're just all misinterpreting it. That would be a problem in your God's dyslexic inability to write a book, I would think. Again, if someone misinterprets your words to start persecuting or killing Christians, does that mean your words caused it? Do, do, did you have the impression at any point that I'm suggesting persecuting or killing no, Christians? not at all, because I don't think your words caused it. I think people can misinterpret things and use things for their advantage. Uh, I make no, I, I have never made any, exactly. any advocation of violence You're correct. At all. You're correct. Absolutely, you're correct. That concludes cross-examination. Big hand. We're going to take a 10-minute break and throw large amounts of money at the bar until they say, stop it, that's too much. Then we will come back with our handsome and beautiful smiling faces and begin Q&A. Thank you. All right. If everyone's ready, we'll start. 
Uh, I am reminded, for whatever reason, to explain what Q&A is. It is where you come here to ask a question. Imagine that. Mind blown. We don't want a 15-minute diatribe with no question. For your question, you have two minutes. Everyone hold two fingers up. Two minutes. Your statement needs to be germane to tonight's topic and two minutes or less. I will start. Had a question submitted by Warren Beam on my phone and the batteries died. Yeah, Warren's a great, great supporter. It was essentially, for each of you, can you define evidence from your perspective? When I talk about evidence, I'm only talking about scientific evidence, which is the way that I define that, and this is after years and years of having to summarize it, is a, is a body of objectively verifiable facts which are positively indicative of or exclusively concordant with only one position over any other. And the reason that I've had to define it that way is because a lot of people will say, well, we're both looking at the same evidence. No. We can both look at the same fact, but if the same fact would be true in either case, then that's just a fact. It doesn't become evidence until it indicates one position or the other. So when I talk about evidence on my channel, it depends on the subject. If I'm talking about history, I'm talking about historical evidence, which is going to be used based on uh, probability type arguments. Science, I might be talking more about a verifiable evidence. I might be talking, if it's in theoretical physics, it's going to be a little bit different. If I'm talking in metaphysics, it's going to be different. If evidence depends on the context and how it's used by philosophers, scientists, historians in that field. Very good. Thank you both gentlemen for, uh, my, by the way, my name is Zach Moore. Hi, Zach! <laughs> um, so thank you both for, uh, for contributing here and having this debate. Uh, I've really appreciated the scientific back and forth. As you know, science is a bit of a hobby of mine, so it's always nice to see that. Um, I was wondering if, if maybe you both could comment either from your understanding of the scientific literature or your own personal experience, either are, are valid as responses to this question. Um, we've, we've talked a lot about whether or not Christianity in general is dangerous. Um, among the different versions of Christianity, denominationally, geographically, and temporally throughout time, which would you say are, have been the most dangerous versions of Christianity that have ever existed or currently exist? If you're asking me which, which version of Christianity is the most dangerous, the, the, the thing that I mentioned in my presentation is that every religion is, is meek and mild and polite and, and according and accommodating and all like that when in their minority. But once they get control, then they dominate everybody else. And for, for in, in Western history, we had this period from uh, roughly, what was it, f uh, 400 CE until 1400 CE, which is a, the, the church ruled everything and killed everything everybody that disagreed with them. So that, I think, and Christianity has been labeled as being the most bloody religion ever in history. They've still exceeded what Islam has ever accomplished. And Islam is already waning in there because they know that they're already, be, they're already facing the objection of the worldwide audience. So they will never rise to the level of horror that Christianity has already accomplished. So whichever one is in charge then? Yeah. Okay. And Michael, your thoughts? Uh, so that would be a difficult decision. I would define it as different groups of Christians. So when I was looking at the literature, religious fundamentalism, as is defined in the literature, it does have a lot of negative correlations. I would probably not define the medieval church. There's a great guy called Tim O'Neill who's an atheist, runs a website called History for Atheists, talks a lot about historical mis misconceptions of the Middle Ages and whatnot, to cover stuff in this book. Uh, but I would probably say if you're going to come to that religious fundamentalist group that we see studied in the literature, people that are advocating for like killing homosexuals, uh, oppression of women, that's bad. I would stand against that. And those groups of people are horrible. All right. Well, I de definitely appreciate that, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kate Smith. Uh, I'm a bisexual trans woman. Um, and the, for the thing for me is I know Christianity is dangerous. There's no debate. I've lived it. Growing up in my teens, I was lived. In, I lived in a very real fear of my family murdering me. So there's no debate whether or not it's dangerous or not. Um, so it may not be dangerous to you, sir, or people like you, but it is da very dangerous to people like me. And my question is, is 
since Christianity is dangerous, what are you doing to make it less dangerous? And to say that it's not dangerous inherently because there are some bad actors is just the no true Scotsman fallacy. So if you could answer that without the Scotsman fallacy, I would appreciate it, sir. So the question is, what am I doing to help make it less dangerous? Yes, sir. Uh, well, I would basically say what I'm doing on my channel and videos like, uh, does God send people to hell? What is heaven? The problem of evil, divine hiddenness, struggling with sin. A video I'm coming out in July on depression is I'm just trying to preach the gospel, say what it says, do what it says, try to just teach, educate, and help people as best I can. I can't speak to your experience. I've not lived it. I don't know what it's like. All I can do is go on what the research I find and what it shows and go from there. So if, if you're asking me what I'm doing, I'm just trying to explain what the Bible says and hope Christians catch on and realize this. One of the things I do on my channel is I try to explain there's no problem for no problem for Christianity with evolution. That's one of my big things and I'm trying to get that across to a lot of Christians. So that's the thing I can say is I'm trying to help educate and teach. I would like to, to chime in on that. I mean, I, I admire that he's trying to correct Christianity on you know the, the, on their interpretations of science and so forth. The, I had a dozen or so questions that I wanted to ask that was uh, that were all pertaining to how are you going to correct the the ills that Christianity is currently causing with different demographics, whether it's politically, ethnically, uh, economically, environmentally, financially, whatever. There's all kinds of damage that Christianity is currently doing, and. And he says that my interpretations are wrong, and I don't know where I'm going to find peer-reviewed studies that show whose interpretation is right, but he's going to, he's going to go with what the Bible says, and that says that, that she's an abomination and that her blood will be upon her. And I don't think there's any argument about that that actually does say that. It, it does. It does. I've had that yelled at me. I've had it quoted to me. I've read it. And that's horrible. I and should I be stoned according to the Bible. And that's horrible. And I would stand against those type of people and say they're horrible human beings. Not if you teach beings. the Bible, though. Well, again, it's I try to go on what scholars say. Anybody, I don't agree with the idea anybody can pick up a book and then know what it, it means, especially in different contexts. We got to go on what a lot of scholars are saying. So well, I recommend it literally books like, says to stone people. Okay, well, I would recommend books like Dilbert Hiller's wrote a book Covenant, uh, The Lost World of the Torah by John Walton. Gene patero has got a great book. Uh, that a lot of that is misunderstanding the cultural context. Uh, Christine Hayes at Yale University has a lot of lectures on this as well. That the Levitical law code is not prescribing minimal sentences. They were never understood that way. And a lot of this comes from a lot of misunderstandings. Now that we have done a lot of archaeological reports, understanding uh, ancient Near Eastern law codes. There's a lot of misunderstanding going on. And again, I would say those people are horrible and that they should be stopped and told that they're horrible human beings. Yeah, and I just wish that God could have written his book a little bit more clearly, if that's the case. Yeah, I'd agree. Thank you both. Gentlemen, very good job tonight. Uh, my name is Brandon Tejdor. Uh, Aaron, my question's primarily for you, but Michael, feel free to jump on if you have any insights. Um, so Aaron, I'm kind of curious. I'm going to answer all his questions too, so that's okay. <laughs> go, go for it, go for it. All right, so my question for you, Aaron, is um, this has been explored in sociology, even in fiction, but it seems that a lot of the abuses that you identify, and I would say majority correctly in Christianity, are actually common abuses of holding of hegemonic power in general, regardless of who's the one actually holding the power. Um, I know you kind of... Uh, loosely dismissed uh, cases like China and Vietnam, but those are cases where we have a largely non- I wasn't, I, did, I didn't dismiss that. That okay. was somebody else. Okay, it sounded like you. I was quoting someone else. All right, my apologies on that misunderstanding and thank you for clarifying. But yeah, um, he, he said that there were exceptions to this, this, this norm or this, uh, this trend that he was seeing and he noted those two exceptions. Okay, uh, so in those cases, it seems that hegemonic power, though non-religious, still produces the very same kinds of results that hegemonic power, when religious, uh, also produces. So I'm just wondering in your um, analysis of these events and situations, are you kind of filtering for that? Like what is uh, a critique of hegemonic, uh, hegemonic power in general? General, uh, as opposed to a specifically religious hegemonic power. Well, I know that when the, the founding fathers established this country, they wanted a division of powers because they didn't want any kind of tyrannical government. They'd already seen every possible example of what a tyrannical government could be, and that was also coming from prior Americans. You know, the colonists, the pilgrims, the, 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 the Quakers, and the Puritans, all killing each other 
over the slightest triviality. And, and of course, I'd also seen the Huguenots versus the Catholics and, and, and the Protestants versus Catholics versus in, in England. They'd already seen what happens when religion takes to power. And they, would, and they just assumed that it's not just religion that's going to do this. It's that anybody that has too much power or any, any faction that would be too powerful is going to be this way. And in fact, later on, it turned out that that was the case with the totalitarians in Russia, that it doesn't, you don't even have to have a religion to be that kind of evil. So they wanted to divide the powers in order to prevent that from ever happening. And I, and I, I admire their wisdom in that respect. Okay. So would you say that Christianity at the or religion in general would be at least significantly less dangerous if it uh, either resisted or did not hold hegemonic power? Do you believe a lot of these abuses are unique to hegemony or do you believe that they are uh, problems that even if they're not in power, they would still seek to abuse in the same way. There are a few ills and evils that are specific to Christianity, but not a lot of them. I mean, it, most evils and ills that, that I would say problematic with religion in, are inclusive of all of them. Now, if we can argue that a gun is dangerous or that a knife is dangerous, well, then people are going to find whatever weapon they can use if the people are also dangerous. Okay. So they're going to use whatever dangerous tool they can to turn it into a weapon, and that's what we've seen happen with religion over and over again and I'm afraid that that's what we're always going to see since nobody can agree on what the hell the interpretation of the scripture is. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there anything you wanted to add, Michael? Or? Yeah, I would just remind people that the studies do not show that intrinsic religiosity is leading to these negative results. It's really hard to make that claim when bad people do bad things. And so this is what psychologists and social scientists do. They try to single out these variates from multivariates uh, and they try to find what are the causes, what are the associations. There are numerous studies on this, and so if it is specifically intrinsic religiosity, Christianity as a form of it, that it leads to this, well, I would just go back to what I said in the opening, my opening statements, that people are just bad and they're gonna look for excuses regardless of what it is. We need to look at the actual scientific data to see if Christianity is making people more bad or if it's other factors. And as far as I can see, the data is not leading that Christianity is making people bad. Yeah, and if I can tack onto that, I, I probably, it would be probably inappropriate to do so, but, but the, the, what makes people bad very often is is the quality of life, which is one of the reasons that that should have been a priority. You know, in making America great again, if for example, what the, the thing that made us great was that we had a higher quality of life than everyone else. And that gives us a huge advantage. And this prompts people toward education, right? This prompts people toward better lifestyles. When you deprive people of that, then you're going to get all kinds of criminality and they're gonna use whatever excuse or tools or weapons they can to that end. Yeah, exactly. Mm, Thank you, will. I appreciate those answers. Glad we agreed on something there. <laughs> hey there, guys. Uh, my name is Edward Newton, uh, and I apparently feedback. Um, Michael, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an atheist, but I'm a huge fan of your channel. Uh, I love the way you cite facts. I have hey. two questions. I'm going to be very quick because I want to respect everybody's time. Uh, the, the first one is for Michael. The second one is for Michael, but also, Arn, I'd like to get your thoughts on it as well. The first one is you cited, I think it was 600 or 800 uh, in the meta study. Uh, I cited there was one meta analysis from 2001 called Religion and Mental Health Evidence for an Association. And, that was, and so that was, that was uh, uh, the correlation between intrinsic religio religiosity and like pro-social behavior, right? It's a, it's a correlation between, uh, to quote it directly, religious involvement is generally associated with greater well-being, less okay. depression and anxiety. Okay, so because you're citing a study that does not focus on Christianity, but instead covers every kind of definition of intrinsic religiosity, doesn't it stand to reason that that study, those studies that you're citing are actually just proving that whatever is causing the good behavior is not specific to Christianity? That it is not part of that's the a, Christian philosophy? Well, that's a good question. Uh, so one of the things I remember is a lot of these studies are done in the United States, Europe, Canada with high Christian volumes. From what I have seen looking into that, because I had the same question as you, most of the people they're studying are Christians or sometimes Jews and sometimes they include Islam in there. But most of the people they're studying are Christians and their intrinsic religiosity. So if you go look at the individual studies they're bringing up, those are the majority the people they're looking at because they're the most available right where the studies are but being it's, done. But it's not actually, there's nothing in the study saying Christianity. We're just assuming because the population is mostly Christian that it must therefore be Christianity, right? We're, 
I, I kind of have a little confused about what you mean. Do you mean like, like, like there's nothing in that study that's targeting the philosophy of Christianity specifically? Like, for example, it could tie back into something like Rat Park, where what is, what's really correlated to well-being is things like community and fellowship. Right, that's right. a good question. And the answer is no, because that would be extrinsic religiosity when people use these things for community, for well-being, getting together. That, that's different in the studies, and that's why they distinguish it. What they look for with intrinsic religiosity is they get people to go, I believe believe in God, I hold to the core tenets of Christianity right. or Judaism, and what but, are the benefits of that vary it there. So if it was all about just being part of a community, we would see the correlations in extrinsic religiosity. Well, I didn't mean to say that it's just being a part of the community, but just that intrinsic religiosity would then entail community and everything like that. So It entails, but they look at that. For example, I cited the one study, the religious orientation scale. Uh -huh. They know those are uh, other factors, and those other factors are not where the positive associations okay. are coming from. That's right. So then my second question for you, but also for you, sir, is um, you, it's more of a, are we sure Christianity isn't dangerous? And specifically for this reason, because Christianity, the philosophy of it, posits itself as the highest moral good, right? Uh, and in that way, can insinuate itself between a person and the law, or even a person and their own feelings, in the case of people who decided not to report priests who were abusing their children because Christianity was the higher good than their own children. Isn't it true that in situations that there, there is a danger present when Christianity is for, there's a, there's a choice between will we protect Christianity or will we protect people? I, I would kind of go on what Aaron was just saying with the last question is that people, when they want to do bad stuff, like hide things, they'll look for well, whatever yeah, but the, excuses but the people, they can. But the people who, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I want to be really clear with what okay. I'm asking. The, the real danger I'm talking about is not the priests. They're, I mean, bad people are bad people. The danger I'm talking about is the thousands of parents who willingly chose not to report the rapist of their children because of their faith. That's the danger I'm talking okay, about. I would, I would push back and say, I don't think it's their faith that's causing it. I think it's an in, in, uh, some sort of uh, emotional desire to sort of protect their in-group, to protect those type of people. And I would need to see some sort of study showing that maybe that intrinsic value they have to sort of protect Christianity is causing it. I mean, people do all sorts of bad things for bad reasons. We cannot make those sort of jumps with unless there's no science behind it. I, if, if someone is trying to protect their priest, well, we need to ask what's their motivation is it because they don't want their priest to look bad well that's a selfish motivation in christianity but, but any any motivation to protect their priest at all would be based on the idea that christianity is the highest moral good right like is that was that unreasonable to suggest that if i may the first time i ever heard about the pedophile priest thing was back in 1991 it was the very first the very first report i'd ever heard of that and it was a group it was a family in louisiana that were very interested in prosecuting and the church refused to allow it and one of the representatives uh, they, they had a priest they was up on charges they had evidence against him and the governor of Illinois, of louisiana at the time pardoned the priest because he was a priest and because we can't question the clergy, but then when the family tried to go beyond the governor to prosecute through the church, their representative, some bishop, announced that if we were to, and this was in 1991 before all of this broke, he said if the church were to prosecute every, as, as he phrased it, homosexual pedophile priest, the church would be in the litigation in the billions of dollars that was 1991. So they already knew that there was a problem. The family had already been made aware, you are are not defeating the richest criminal organization there ever was. Uh and I would respond, yeah, that's bad. But to say that there's sort of intrinsic values or sort of belief that Christianity is the highest moral good is what's causing that, there's just no evidence of that. People do bad things all the time, and they look for excuses. If you're part of an in-group, like, say, the Catholic Church, you may want to protect that group because it could make you look bad. But that's a selfish desire. That's not actually Christianity causing that, which speaks against these types of selfish desires. So we actually need to see some sort of evidence that maybe the promotion of Christianity or their belief in Christianity was causing that type of things. I, I, I can't speak for everyone's motives in these types of situations. I can't psychoanalyze them. I don't know what to tell you. I can only go on what the science stuff, scientific studies say. Okay, for Michael. My name's Joseph. Uh, my dad's a pastor, and to his disappointment, I left the faith. Um, 
the understanding <laughs> I have of the Old Testament law is that there is a ceremonial law with things like animal sacrifice, uh, circumcision, etc. There is the moral law like the Ten Commandments, and there is the governmental law um, that basically enacts those laws. Um, when it comes to the uh, ceremonial law, uh, for example, when it comes to eating food, there's Peter's vision of, in Acts that said, here, take and eat, and it shows unclean animals. Uh, and there's also in Colossians, uh, not letting people condemn you for food, drink, or how you celebrate the Sabbath. Um, in Galatians, it says, basically says that circumcision doesn't make a difference, that you know people are in Christ whether or not they're circumcised. We don't have to sacrifice animals because uh, Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. Um, here's that, and I basically go, went through and cited the New Testament to show why the ceremonial law doesn't make a difference, why we don't need to worry about it. Uh, my concern is with the Ten Commandments, there are some laws like uh, forcing women to have abortions if they're suspected of cheating, killing rebellious sons, uh, killing non-screaming rape victims, which is in Deuteronomy, killing homosexuals in Leviticus. Those all all align with the Ten Commandments. And on top of that, in uh, First Corinthians, I believe, no, Romans, sorry, uh, Paul says that the government is made by God and that the government does not bear the sword in vain. And extremist Christians can take the uh, verses I mentioned and say, hey, we should enact those. The, that's God's holy and sacred law. Is there any verse in the New Testament that says that either forbids or at least discourages implementing those laws into our government? Uh, well, Sorry, long question. doesn't make governmental claims. So this is one of the things about Christianity is more focusing on the ethics of the person, the morality, personal salvation. The verse in Romans was about uh, submitting to governments is a lighter word in the Greek. And I've been looking into this because in relation to the Hebrew, the Ephesians 5, it just sort of means to show sort of respect. Paul used it interchangeably with a word for respect. So this is the same Christians who were being fed to the lions and praying in secret. They obviously were not sacrificing the Caesar, even though they were told to do that. So the submitting the governments does not mean obeying the governments. And so the, the New Testament basically sets up a new covenant. Jesus says today, I give thee a new law, to love thy neighbors as thyself or love one another. That's not a new law, it's in Leviticus. But it's a part of the new law, it's a new law of the new covenant, so there will be new stipulations with that. So there's no theocracy presented in the stipulations of the new covenant. There's no governmental sort of law set up in the new covenant. So I mean that would not actually be part of the new covenant as in and of itself. We'd have to look at the stipulations itself and see what it says. Aaron, do you have anything to say about that? I think it's... Uh, it, no, I don't. I'm not. I'm, I'm going to bow out of that. Okay. Thank you. Um, because of the time limit, I have to compress my question here, if you could be a little patient. Um, I was looking at the Pew Religious Landscape Survey because you're looking for... I'm kind of having a hard time hearing you. You're looking for research. Everybody so, has a hard time hearing her. <laughs> yeah, you're looking for research. So I, um, I was looking at the Pew Religious Landscape Survey. And uh, according to that, 83% um, of evangelical Christians believe in hell. And uh, the majority of people surveyed believe in hell. But there, there were non-Christians in that. And um, but the three main largest groups of Christians in this country, the majority believe in hell. So my question here is, you could either answer yes, I believe in hell too, and that you have a dangerous belief, or are you going to answer no, I don't believe in hell for this interpretation of the Bible, even though the New Testament says that Jesus will throw people in a lake of fire. Um, so. Why are you just special pleading? And if you're God, do you worship a omniscient, omnipotent God? And why can't he communicate 
to his followers in a way that everybody understands they, couldn't, they should not scare little children of burning forever. Okay, well, those are very long questions. I won't have time to answer them all in depth, but I do have videos I will reference that go into this. I did a lot of these this past winter. Uh, with regards to hell, yes, I do believe in hell. I don't believe it's literal fire. I did a video called Does God Send People to Hell? And we have to remember something about Jesus. He's always talking in terms of metaphors. You know, you get this speck out of your eye before you get the log out of someone else's eye. What is a lake so, of fire a metaphor for? Okay, it's, it's, I explain pretty in depth in the video. It's for of a it fire. It should be pretty sort of, simple. It's a lake of fire disintegrating the sins of person. The person is being disintegrated. That's the metaphor. For eternity? I, I can't, I'm having a hard time hearing. For eternity, though. Okay, disintegrating yeah, I, your sins for eternity. The Bible does seem to clearly <laughs> state that you're Even if he were to sit you in a timeout room to think about your sins forever, that would be pretty darn boring I, and uh, I, I very mean, Jesus evil. does explicitly state that he himself will crush the unbelievers in a bloody wine press until we are knee deep in their blood. Our blood, my blood. You think it's literally going to be a wine press? Is Jesus lying? He, uh, he's using metaphors to speak to theology. Okay, where is there, how is it a metaphor? You are told to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is the God, the, the representative of God, defying the first commandment. You are supposed to believe that Jesus is the God before gods that defies that first commandment. And if you don't believe that, Jesus threatens that he will crush you in the bloody brine. Now, where is there a metaphor? How is it a metaphor? Nobody understands it that it's way. It's literally a metaphor because you just said it. It's crushing in a wine press. Now, I don't know what passage you're referring to, but this is what Jesus does. He talks okay. about camels and gnats and uses parables. The parables 83% are, on, of finish. Christians believe that they're going to go to a literal hell to be literally tortured, literally for eternity, literally for not believing that one thing. Christians. Do you have a study that somehow shows it's dangerous? What do you want from the me? The one she just cited That's is the one I'm referring to. Of what people of 35, believe. 35,000 people. Beliefs inform actions. You cannot separate beliefs from actions. Okay, yes, you can, and that's actually done in the studies. It's not so. They Everything do. you act upon, you believe. It, actions are different in the psychology studies than beliefs. Someone can have a belief you may not like. That doesn't mean it's going to manifest in bad actions. So if a mother uh, d uh, murders her child so that she, she's afraid that that child will go to hell if she doesn't do it, it her belief caused the murder. Those murders have happened in if, modern times. If her belief does cause action, then yeah, it can have bad consequences. But it's not, it's not scientific to argue that beliefs somehow lead to actions necessarily. <clears throat> Uh, this question's for uh, Arn. Um, you, uh, you mentioned that in 20 years of rigorous research, you found no evidence, uh, I think you said, of Christianity. But no, 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 that's not what I said. I said in 20 years of arguing with Christians that they told me that, the, that I'm wrong about the belief in faith, that faith is not a belief that is not based on evidence. Right? I say that faith is a belief that is not based on evidence. They all say, oh, yeah, we have evidence. I say, okay, fine. What is it? And I've always specified that I'm looking for scientific evidence. They ask, what evidence would I expect? Accept. I said, how much evidence would you, would you accept, they would ask. I said, I'll take anything that qualifies as evidence. Any body of, of objectively verifiable facts which positively indicate or exclusively concord with that particular position over any other. In 20 years, I, I think I get, without I get exception, okay. there has been no one to present any scientific evidence that actually indicates the Christian God or indeed any God or in fact anything supernatural at all. Okay, I appreciate the clarification. So, you mentioned that in 20 years of rigorous research, you found no evidence of what you're looking for, but then when Michael pressed you on naming just one scholar who defines the word faith in the way you put it, you couldn't name one. So my question is, could it be possible that your research is maybe flawed, biased, and even maybe dangerous to the pursuit of truth? I have conducted this experiment, as I explained, over and over and over and over again, having this exact conversation at least once a week for 20 years. Not one Christian ever has produced evidence. He didn't either, nor can you. No one can. It doesn't exist. That's not the I debate demand tonight. that anybody, anybody in this room who calls yourself a Christian, if you think you have scientific evidence to indicate you're God, bring it. You ain't got it. I win. I'm sorry my question upset you, but that wasn't my question, but I'll move on. Thank you. <laughs> he said, I'm sorry my question upset you, but that's not what Hello, Aaron and IP. 
Hi. Uh, hello, Aaron, not an IP. Hi. Uh, inspiring philosophy. Yes, yeah. how you doing? Yeah. Um, my question is an extension of one of the previous questions. The debate topic tonight is, is Christianity dangerous? Uh, there's this uh, meme that shows, uh, it shows a uh, Muslim government, Christian government, atheist government, uh, Buddhist government, et cetera, et cetera. I think what we're missing here is it's not so much, although religion often is used, including taxing people for their sins, I agree to that, to that uh, extent. Isn't the common denominator government here to where that we should advocate for self-ownership and abolishing the power to be begin with um, no. so that way we can so no, so no, no rational person is advocating uh, anarchy statism is the utopian idea that just the right amount of violence used by just the right people in just the right way can make a perfect society so can't we give people to uh, self ownership that rather than having people dictate a religious set of beliefs or a non-religious set of beliefs how about we just leave people to hell alone how do you just leave people to hell alone? There's a reason that government exists. It has a minimal responsibility to its citizenry that it's supposed to take care of. It's supposed to defend and it's supposed to provide for. This is in the Constitution, right? It doesn't have to own and control and dictate everything that you do in your life. And that's why there's a division of powers and that's why we're supposed to have liberty. And that's why we have a, a system of courts instead of a corporatocracy wherein we can take our grievances and have them corrected. Nobody's suggests anarchy because we've already lived that. Well, yeah, we have lived anarchy for a long time before people figured out how to make a government. We spent thousands and thousands of years of people randomly killing each other with the, with the, with the jawbone of an ass and that sort of thing before we figured out how we could how we can maybe dictate some laws, have some kind of fair trade and reasonable protection for the elderly and so forth. One of the things that Eric July says is that statism is a religion. Is that we? They even say where uh, Abraham. Lincoln Lincoln statue that in this temple is that the state and they call often call statheist atheists who worship the state as statheists it is a religion yeah I, I don't worship the state well very you just clear. use the state as, I as, very as a moral ground I obviously do not worship the state I think that we should have minimal government as I expressed in my opening statement in this debate I believe that I want a I want less government than the religious right wants I agree I, I want agree. significantly less but that doesn't mean that I don't want any there are places in the country there are places in this world right now that don't have any and those people are dying if they're not heavily armed I would uh, put that to an attribution error because there are examples like Liechtenstein I, I, what he said it's an attribution error. I couldn't hear uh, but we and by the way, that was, not in any set, that was not, your question was not remotely germane to the topic of tonight's yeah, no, conversation. No, 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 it was that the problem, or that rather than Christianity be de being dangerous, that's government itself that's the danger. The power itself is the there issue. There are many different types of governments, and some of them are humanitarian, and some of them are compassionate. Not all of them are dictatorial. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just real quick, um, an anecdote. I was a very conservative Christian. Um, I was. I had certain beliefs about um, homosexuality, conservatism, that type of thing, up until about 2012, um, when I became an atheist. And one of the re one of the things that was keeping me having those beliefs was the Christianity that I knew. It's a very you know literal you know version of the Bible that, that I knew then. When I became an atheist, my beliefs did a complete 180. That's my experience. That's the experience of other atheists that I know. But another thing I found as I tried to talk to a lot of Christians, I promise I'm getting to a question in a second, but another thing I found as I talked to a lot of Christians is that there are a lot of different um, interpretations of the Bible. Um, just with my, my background, my, my doctorate is in literature, um, uh, modern American literature, and one of the things I found in that is that you can take a passage and you can have 20 different scholars read it 20 different ways. And I found that something similar with the, in the Bible, like even hermeneutics. If you, if you go to something as simple as Wikipedia and look up biblical hermeneutics, you'll find 20 different ways just in that small Wikipedia article as far as how people interpret scripture. 
so when that when I saw that I was like well I appreciate stuff that you're doing which is trying to figure out ways to interpret the Bible that hurt fewer people but I think there's I, a I lot wanna, of ways I want to add to that that I appreciate that too yeah so anything he can do anything he can do to minimize the injustice that other Christians are causing I wholly advocate but I would also I also think that there's a lot of interpretations of the Bible that do hurt people and I think you might agree with that too right well here's my question so you have this demarcation it seems between intrinsic or this scholarly demarcation I guess is this question is for you between um, intrinsic holding a belief of Christianity and social um, you know extrinsic like more social yeah. um, attachment to Christianity and I'm wondering if that's not as somebody earlier said um, a form of no true Scotsman basically if it's a belief that follows with my particular line of hermeneutics with the line of hermeneutics I've chosen for my version of Christianity then it's more intrinsic and if it's not then it's more social and if that's not what you're saying then I'd like a clear definition of what exactly is intrinsic Christianity holding a Christianity and what exactly is social and how do you how do, how do you see the difference without reading people's minds uh, this, it depends on what researchers are doing so they'll do certain types of tests like they'll give them very subtle tests to take uh, where there's like subtle questions to sort of get them in that way there's a lot of different ways to do this sometimes they'll use sorts of time at priming methods uh, when I'm talking about intrinsic Christianity is a form of intrinsic religiosity when we're talking about extrinsic religiosity those are more like cultural Christians people that are saying well I go to church because it helps me feel better about myself or I go to church to be a part of my community you don't really care about the doctrine of what's actually in the religion you're there because well I, I like it it feel it makes me feel better it makes it good. So researchers will sort of ask people subtle questions to sort of prime them to get them to know what they're doing. And there's pretty rigorous methods for this. This has been going on since I think 1967 to sort of distinguish what types of different types of people are in these studies. But if they're, so these extrinsic, I'm sorry to ask a follow-up real quick. So I'm just having a hard time hearing you. Everyone sorry, um, sorry about this. There's a lot of background just, noise. Just to follow up real quick. Um, so this in extrinsic Christianity, I'm just trying to understand. I'm not trying to argue. Um, but this extrinsic Christianity, if it has positive effects, like if it makes people feel better about themselves, if it makes, if it enables uh, relationships to be stronger, if it gives them, if it makes the, their lives all around better, and that's why they decide to become a Christian, how is that more dangerous than... I thought because I think maybe I misheard you, but I thought you said that intrinsic Christianity has a lot of positive effects. Extrinsic Christianity has more negative effects. Well, I wouldn't say extrinsic Christianity. It, the, 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 or extrinsic belief. Extrinsic religiosity is the correct term used in the literature. Okay. Uh, if you want to know a little bit more about that stuff, I'd recommend this paper, The Religious Orientation Scale Review and Met meta-analysis of social desirability effects. They define it quite well in there. Maybe that would help kind of clarify I'm, the I'm, terms. I'm, but I'm asking you now, like, why is the extrinsic more dangerous than the intrinsic? Well, it, it's about the effects that show up in the studies. Now, I don't, I can't speak on, like, why necessarily, but that's what the studies are showing. So, for example, if there was a study that showed that eating hamburgers uh, led to cancer, okay, we may not know exactly how, but the scientific research could show correlations. Now, that's just an example. I'm not claiming that. But it really depends on the different types of measures they're doing and what is showing up in people, and it's going to be different for every study. But what specific, what specific like, dangers are in extrinsic oh, that aren't in this, extrinsic? Okay, so there was a study done on racism. It actually showed extrinsic. Intrinsic religiosity increases prejudice, racism. Uh, there was one that showed it increases non-marital affairs, uh, higher rates of depression, lower quality of life, a lot of different things. Now, there have been some that have shown some positive correlations, but they're far and few in between. Hi. Um, so I'm a Christian, and I am been in what a two, three year relationship with the atheist. No problem to me. I have homosexual and transgender friends, stuff like that. Not a problem to me. 
But my question is, how are you deeming Christianity as dangerous? And this is to you, and you can follow up with your answer. But how are you, do, like, what effects of Christianity, be it extrinsic probably, um, that is dangerous to society itself? Because we have seen, actually, yeah, we have seen where... Um, Researchers have actually said that yes, even though that Christianity, Islam, Judaism, and other religions of the like have been dangerous in the past, that they're actually evolving to a more, um, I guess, maybe more tolerable, I guess. Um. Well, Christianity has been forced to become mm -hmm. more tolerant because the society at large doesn't allow the atrocities that they used to allow. I mean, we, we see the Pope, who's supposed to be the, 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 the leader of the, the Catholic Church, Christ on which, is, uh -huh. which is the dominant, dominant denomination among Christianity still. There are more Catholics than there are Protestants of all denominations combined. Because it all branched off of Catholicism, yes. Well, no, it, it really didn't. It actually, uh, Orthodoxy came first, mm. but, but Catholicism took over. But the problem is, is, it, is it the, we can see in the news, we can see that the Pope is playing a game of catch-up. So there are humanitarian issues that have long passed them, and, and the Pope is trying to catch up to them. And he's saying, what I saw in a t-shirt once in the 70s, he says, I must hurry and catch up to them, for I am their leader. Which I thought was hilariously funny, but that is actually applicable to the Catholic Pope. They're trying to do a, a customer service fix of an issue where they were where they were misleading people wholesale, and they're not no no they are now trying to contradict themselves to be to appear more humanitarian, or they're going to be completely irrelevant. Would you say the same? Just a quick follow up to that. Would you say the same for um, like Judaism or any other Christ, uh, Excuse me, any other religion? The advantage that Judaism has is twofold. One, the Jews represent such a small minority of the current body of religious believers that even though they started all this mess, they don't they don't account for much of it anymore. And the atrocities for which they were guilty were literally thousands of years ago. So we have a much more recent history with Christianity and now we have like a current Christianity with Islam. And the thing that Islam is experiencing is that Islam can't get, ever get away with the shit that Christianity got away with because the worldwide opinion won't allow it. And because the Islam cannot con today con uh, control the entire global populace, like even Christianity couldn't do in the beginning of the age of, of the of age of reason. They were already losing hold of the scholarship, and so they realized they had to back off. Well, wasn't that because of the separation of state and church, though? No, like, no, no. Because we're, we're, the, we're talking about the the rise of the age of reason, so we're talking about like more more clo closer to um, the Renaissance. Okay, and, and and still centuries before uh, John Locke and others who inspired our government. <laughs> Would you like to follow up on that question of how, like, um, religion was at a time very violent before, but do you see that if there is an evolution, like we're having this conversation today yeah. about is sure. it dangerous, and do you think that it's becoming more or less dangerous? Okay, so this has gone around for a long time. So Vox Day went through, you know, all of the... Um he went through the Encyclopedia of Wars and found that of 123 of all 1,763 wars of the religious was only less than 7%. And when you took Islam out, it was less than 4%. Uh, I would recommend a study, Why We Don't Practice What We Preach, a meta-analytical review of religious racism. And they note directly in the study that, that they can find no correlation, and this is in the conclusion, they can find no correlation between endorsement of religious doctrine specific to Christian faith and racial prejudice. So a lot of these uh, things that have been sort of going away, because they note in the study that racism has been declining uh, in extrinsic or religious fundamentalist groups, and it's probably not a causal relation with the religious doctrines because they can't find that in the actual evidence. So it's probably more cultural, socio-economical factors that are contributing to this that existed in the past, and intrinsic religiosity seems to be helping, you know, get rid of this, and that's what we want to see more. So more intrinsic re religiosity would help you believe that Christianity is less dangerous than you're proclaiming it to be. I would first have to believe that there was some element of truth to it, and I know there's not. 
Okay. <laughs> Thanks okay. for your time. Hi. Uh, I apologize. I had to write this down, otherwise I'd figure out for it. Um, so, weapons of mass destruction are the product of science. Without science, you cannot have nuclear weapons. Can you speak you cannot... right into the mic? Sure. I'm... Uh, so, weapons of mass destruction are the product of science. Without science, you cannot have nuclear weapons, chemical, biological, vivisectionists, eugenicists, many racial supremacists have all used science to justify their position. My point is, science is demonstrably dangerous. But that does not in any way negate the value of science, nor does it negate the truth of science. However, if we should reject Christianity out of hand simply because it is dangerous, by that logic, should you not also reject science out of hand simply because it is dangerous? I hope that you did not I, miss I beg your pardon. I haven't finished yet. Alternatively, uh, if... Uh, just given the fact that Christianity demonstrably can be dangerous, why should that have any bearing on whether or not it is true? Christi the, the danger that Christianity constantly presents has no necessary bearing on whether it is true. If we pretend for a minute that there really was a God, and that there was any element of truth to the Christianity, and that the, you know, the Bible is God's word and all of that, then we have the writing of an author who is obviously an incompetent, who told us absolutely nothing of the information that we actually needed to learn, and told us only this, that you have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and He's the representation and He is the and you have to believe that in order to get into heaven. If you don't believe in Jesus, you're not getting into heaven, you're done. Everything else, you're 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 gonna go to hell. That's it, that's all. No useful information whatsoever. The the the, the, the fallacy of Christianity, um I, I don't remember exactly the way that you phrased it. Science is dangerous. Guns are dangerous. Drugs are dangerous. There's a lot of things that we use that are dangerous. We have to figure out how to use them responsibly or how not to use them at all. And in the case of religion, where there is no practical application and no evident truth whatsoever, I would suggest put it down and use reason instead. That's a fair answer. Thank you. What's up, guys? Um... First point, I was wondering if both of you guys could just share your uh, sources that you like compiled for your oh, talk so to put in the comments for when they post okay. the video. I will say that um, I had a prepared a PowerPoint presentation, but there was a mishap. I don't know if I didn't communicate okay. it correctly. He's going to take my PowerPoint slides and put them in the video that will be online. So if you're watching this online later, the PowerPoint slides should be in there. Uh, and so I also mentioned all the studies when I was talking. I don't have time to relist them all. There's so many. Okay. I was just going to say, I think it would be useful if they put them in there. I had a the hard time also listing my sources, so I can yeah. imagine what he went through. I kind of have two questions, but I'll try to just make it one. So, Aaron, you mentioned that you think that basically religion has no practical application. So, yeah. Uh, only accurate information has practical application. Only – okay. That's sort of – your definition kind of answers my question because what I was going to ask is uh, if that's the case, why is the massive majority of people in the world – religious in the sense that when, I guess I would define religion as sort of like trying to understand God or seeking God you know in Hinduism God is sort of everything and if I may to my experience every religion universally accepted as such by both by both its adherents and its critics is a faith-based belief system positing the notion that a supernatural essence of self somehow survives the death of the physical body to continue on in some other form even the Pharisees and the Sadducees believed this a lot of people say that they didn't but according to the Jews they did so every religion holds this one belief we all want it apparently they all want a cheap death and continue living on some other way. And there is apparently for them, not for me, but for them, there is a beauty in that thought that when you die, you keep going, that it's not the end. 
I remember being well, that, a small. That seems like a practical application, though, because it affects how people like want how people live their life now because they're concerned about the afterlife. So it, it just seems to fly okay, in the face well, of the idea that it's. There's right, no, I, I suspected there's, this would come there's up. There's no practical application. Yeah, I was. I suspected this would come up. George Bernard Shaw said, "The fact that a believer is happier than a skeptic." is no more to the point than the fact that a drunken man is happier than a sober one. The happiness of credulity is a cheap and dangerous quality of happiness and by no means a necessity of life. So, it doesn't matter how pleasant it is. The only value any information can have is however accurate you can show it to be. And if you can't show that it is accurate at all, it has no value at all, and that dismisses every sermon I've ever heard as literally worthless. I, I hear you. I, I feel like you're way too far on the dogmatic end of the spectrum, but I was having a discussion with your friend. What was his name? The uh, something skeptic. Uh, uh, the guy that was sitting, Drew, who's sitting right here. Oh, genetically modified skeptic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he brought up what I thought was a pretty reasonable point. And basically For a that, young guy, he's pretty together. Okay. Yeah, well, he brought up a good point, which I feel like was sort of, uh, I don't know if you saw the discussion between Dr. Tim McGrew and Dr. Peter Bogosian on Unbelievable. They were talking, arguing about the definition. Peter Bogosian and who? Dr. Tim McGrew. Um, but he, he brought up a good point, which is basically that uh, it seems like the, the lay person's understanding of the concept of faith is not being factored in to sort of this scholarly dissection of the Bible or the historical context or the definition of faith. And so how do we go about factoring in the common person's sort of understanding of faith? And I feel like that's what Dr. Bergosian was trying to argue when he was talking with Dr. McGrew, which is basically that he's had all these conversations with, you know, college age kids and he seems to think that faith is believing without evidence is how he defines it or believing no, what, where there what, is what no Bogosian evidence. Bogosian literally says and Bogosian is a friend of mine I talked to him two days ago. Okay. Bogosian says and he's not the first one to say this the first one to say this was me okay that faith is pretending to know what mm. you don't know. Sure. I said that in my book I said that in my video series but he did another he did a whole lecture on that very topic and he's right. Faith really is pretending to know what you don't know. Yeah. And all religions, every one of them, right, cites facts that are not facts while pretending to know what they don't know. It is the, faith is the most dishonest position it is possible to have, so any, fa any belief that requires faith should be rejected for that reason. I mean, I understand that's your definition, but I think that that's contingent upon a lot of historical data. If for, you can for, show me another definition that is more accurate, I'd be happy to adopt it. But after 20 years, nobody's been I mean, able to cough one up. Yeah, I mean, I think that what Michael did was a good exercise is where he took the, the you know, the New Testament was written in Greek. So he, he took the term that is used in the New Testament with his pistis. And he but he looked, didn't change the stories, did he? Well, but he, he looked at how that Greek word is used across Greco-Roman literature. Literature, you know, uh -huh. like Plato, Aristotle, all these guys, and and, and yeah, and nobody ever uses the term to mean what you're defining it as. Yeah, so everybody it, does, and not that nobody ever does. Not just in the Bible, not just throughout the Bible, not just every time the Bible talks about faith, it describes it the way I say. Not just that, but also in the Quran, every time the the Quran talks about faith, it defines it the way I say. Every time in the Bhagavad Gita that defines faith, it defines it the way I say. Every Every time everybody says this unless you're not talking about the ancient scriptures if you're talking about an apologist who's trying to defend the belief today they'll all say oh faith is a, ba a belief that is based on evidence what evidence oh I don't know I don't have any period done thank you for your question First of all, thank you both for being here tonight. <laughs> thank you for the good discussion. By the I, way, I, wanna, I wanna say something real, real quick, and I don't, I don't, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I argue with creationists most of the time. And the most irritating, honestly, most irritating thing about arguing with creationism is I know they are lying to me. I know they're deliberately dishonest. I know they're absolute f***ing frauds and that they know it. But I don't get that impression from you. Thank you, appreciate that. <laughs> Okay, my question is, 
Arn, I believe in your opening statement you said that slavery was an enduring legacy of Christianity, yet I also know Quakers and other Christians were among the first abolitionists. So they for were. Michael, can I ask, like, was there a systematic difference or misunderstanding regarding Christianity as defined in the Bible and the Atlantic slave trade, for instance? Yes, very much so. Uh, if you check out some... What's the name of it? Uh, there's a great book called... Um, so, so one of the things I try to note, I don't remember the name of the book off the top of my head, but if you t look at like Exodus 21, 16, it directly outlaws the Atlantic slave tribe. You cannot kidnap someone and force them into slavery. A David, the same word for slave that shows up in Exodus is also what David is a mercenary for the Philistines. It's a lot of cultural misunderstandings, and I've even seen very liberal scholars note that. There was a great debate recently by Michael Brown and Dr. Josh Bowen, and they go over a lot of these types of things. Now, I don't agree with either of them entirely in that. I'm going to be doing my own video series on this, and I'm going to try to go pretty in-depth into this. It's a very complicated issue, and when people try to simplify it to these uh, left and right, these basic terms, uh, they're, do they're not doing justice to the scholarship. And so I want to try to get to the cultural context of this term, and I think that's what we need to do. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Uh, two questions. Love the hair, dude. Thanks, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing double. Uh, first one's for you. Um, yeah. So... Richard Dawkins says that uh, you should mock and ridicule, uh, ridicule people for their religious beliefs. Do you agree with that? Did, did, that we should mock religious beliefs? Well, no, he said that you should mock and ridicule, ridicule people for their religious beliefs. He said it on a stage in front of a lot of people. No, no. I, I mock religion, and I want to be very clear about this point. And I, I said this in my presentation, but I, I realized I was, I, I was going through 4,000 words in 25 minutes, so I, I, I appreciate that not everybody caught everything. <laughs> But um, we, we mock ideas, but not people, because the best defenders of reason and rationality were all, all of them, former believers. I mean, you, it's a very rare thing that you will ever find somebody that was raised an atheist and was always an atheist. It's the people who come out of having a former religious belief and who have the background in that religious belief and in believing in that religious belief. When they wake up to that, they become my greatest adversary. And so I, everybody, every time I talk to a religious believer, I consider the possibility that I might be talking to the next Matt Bill Mac Dillahunty. But I guess uh, you might have heard me wrong, because so, Richard Dawkins says specifically you should ridicule and mock people for, those, for having those beliefs. So, I mean, do you agree with that? Should you mock people? I do people? not agree that you should mock people. Okay, okay. You should mock beliefs. Gotcha. And, and just, just, just uh, and another point of clarification, yeah, yeah. because I think, I think this came up earlier. I do not and have never advocated violence against anybody right. either. That's true. I, I put lies and violence in the same category. Either one is only ever excusable in moments of desperate self-defense and maybe not even then. Okay. And I was just using that as an analogy earlier. I would never say Aaron has advocated violence. Right. I've never heard him say that. <laughs> and then my uh, last question for both of you, is atheism dangerous or can it be dangerous? Is atheism what? Is dangerous it, or can it be dangerous? The is, opposite is atheism of, dangerous? Yeah, the opposite of <laughs> Not <laughs> believing impossible nonsense for no good reason is not itself inherently dangerous. There, there are some studies looking into specifically atheists and agnostics. Uh, there was one that came out this year, our atheists... Uh, unprejudiced, and it found that they did have discriminatory attitudes towards religious believers. Now, I would, my, I'll be the first to say, okay, we have one study. I want to see it replicated. I want to see a meta-analysis eventually. So I would not make that claim yet that it is. Now, the specific belief that there is no God or I lack a belief in God, that's obviously not dangerous. Uh, so we would need to look more at these people, what where they're getting those attitudes from. And the research is very new in this subject. Uh, they've looked mostly at like intrinsic religiosity, extrinsic religiosity. This has been going on since decades now. So there will probably be more research specifically on like atheist groups. And I will withhold judgment until we get more data. Gotcha. Thank you both. All right, so I think you're the last man. I think that's right. All right, so um, my question is largely about the use of studies um, and the value that that has uh, generally. So um, certainly, you know, historically, you can't go backwards and, um, you know, if you're retrospectively analyzing religious groups, 
it's not possible to use studies to determine whether a religious system is safe or dangerous. I mean, do you agree with that? No. I okay. wouldn't say that we, we, we can use studies as indications, but they're not absolute. Uh, yeah, I would agree with that to a degree. Like, so, would, for, for example, like, you know, say if we're going to de determine whether or not, you know, ancient Roman religion is dangerous or not, it's impossible to determine that using studies. Fair enough? Now, now he can cite a study, and I haven't read it yet, and I'm not going to take his word on it, but if, I, if he cites a study and I read it, and I understand that it is peer-reviewed and therefore has a degree of, meaning other experts have looked at this and verified that this is actually a thing, this data is re reliable, that the, that the data ex actually exists as detected, does that necessarily imply what it seems to? That's up to interpretation, but I, I can't dismiss the data then as invalid. Okay, so this is one of the questions earlier asked, like how do we identify? A lot of these studies are looking specifically at the religions we have now. I, I can't speak to ancient Roman religion, I, uh, because obviously we can't study that, but that's not really the topic tonight. I was just focusing on well, Christianity today. Well, so if, if, um, if the data itself is necessary lim necessarily limited, so if, if we're in a realm in which you cannot come to a certain conclusion one way or the other using studies, I mean, for example, historically, if we're going to decide whether, you know, ancient Roman religion is safer or more dangerous than Christianity, or if we're going to be determining, you know, th these types of questions, you cannot resort to studies. So without, because I, I know for you, clearly, your interest is, is modern, I guess, control group based studies. But if you're going to, to exclude use of those, so if we're going to make these determinations without that, without the use of those studies, how do you come to the conclusion whether or not Christianity is safer or more dangerous than alternative religions? Why would I exclude the data? So if, because the data is limited, so the, if the data is limited, so if we're going to be looking at, for example, Hinduism, do you have... Say that you, again, looking at what? Hinduism. For example, if we're going to look at Hinduism. Hinduism, okay. If you're going to be comparing Christianity to Hinduism, do you have, I mean, do you have studies that show, that have a con control group where you're looking at the same group of people, where you split them up yeah, by some religion? Some studies have split up different types of religion. Uh, yeah. Some studies I've read recently split up even atheists and agnostics. This may seem counterintuitive for my, my participation in this debate, but I don't think either of us is going to just reject or deny data. Well, and it, it, the studies are not absolute, but if the studies are all that we have, that's, all, that's literally all the data we have. Well, right. So the data is limited. So, for example, like say, I mean, this is an issue that comes up in gun control, where you have a country that has gun control and a country that doesn't have gun control, and you compare murder rates. Well, there are a load of other factors, right? There is a ton of other factors. So, one country is Hindu, one country is Christian. You can't, act, you don't run an experiment where you say, okay, Hindu country, y'all all of a sudden all become Christian for a year, and we'll see whether the murder rates go up or down. You don't. It's not available, right? You don't have that actual experiment. Right experimental data. Right. So given the limitation in that data, if you exclude the use of those studies, is there any other means? Do you have any other method for actually well, we analyzing? Would, neither, of us, neither of us would exclude the data. Okay, so we would, we would be able to say that according to the data that we have, the indications are, and then right? either of us could make arguments to the contrary based on other additional information we may produce. We also have to remember, like, yeah, there are, we could, it could always be so much better. Like, maybe someday we'll get really advanced quantum computers and we can run those types of simu simulations you're talking about. So maybe we'd have something like that. So there could be more. All I can say is I'm going on the data that I have, and that's what I have to base myself. And the data that you have is for individual behavior, right? Not the societal behavior. You don't have data where you show this Christian society behaves this way. The, the, the studies you rely on are primarily individual behavior, right? There, it's on individuals, but individuals make up societies. Right. So. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Too much. Uh, sorry, I'm just looking at time. But yeah, yeah. I, it's, anyway, I, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, fair enough. Thanks for your time. No worries. I have a question for Aaron. Can I have a strand of your beautiful hair? <laughs> no, you'll use it in a spell. <laughs> <laughs> you, you caught me. Thank you both. Uh, closing statements, two minutes. 
Arn? All right. Well, my, my closing statement is, as I mentioned before, I mean, if, if we pretend that there was a God, and I have no reason, honestly, to, to believe or, or, or imagine that there is one, then if God wrote the book, which we know was written by people, but if we imagine that the, that the God was written by, or that the, book, the Bible was written by God, then he provided absolutely no useful information. <laughs> It was provided an awful lot of information that was false, which is why a lot of people still today believe that the earth is flat because the Bible says it was. Right? So that already is a danger. It says that homose homosexuals should be killed, and that's a danger. It gives a number of other edicts that cause people to be killed. There's a whole lot of different topics of why the Bible is dangerous in what it reads. And there's no way to verify what the interpret which is the correct interpretation, and that's a danger too. <laughs> Right? But what the Bible tells us literally is only this, we should believe that Jesus was the Son of God, and if not, we're going to burn in hell. Which, if it tells us nothing else, is that God is completely unjust in the way that he judges people. And therefore, our judgment should be unjust as well. There's no way that Christianity cannot be dangerous. And the history that I've shown for all the different denominations warring with each other about how they interpret each of the different scriptures proves that Christianity is deeply dangerous. Arn Ra, thank you. Thank you. So one of the things I like studying is quantum mechanics, and there are numerous interpretations of quantum mechanics, and then within certain interpretations of quantum mechanics, physicists disagree. There are numerous ways to interpret scientific data. That does not mean science is, is completely unobtainable or that it could be whatever we could want it to be. That's Paul Firebender talking, and there's a problem with that. So just because there are different interpretations, that does not necessarily mean there is not a correct one. That does not necessarily mean there is a good one. Uh, so. That's what hermeneutics is. We study the exegesis of the text and we debate based on probabilistic arguments. What has the most explanatory scope? What is the most explanatory power? What is the least ad hoc? Does it provide illumination? Uh, these are types of measures that we are going to use. Uh, when it comes to is Christianity dangerous, uh, we can just simply look at the data. If we think Christianity is gonna cause people to kill homosexuals, then data can show it, it would reveal these discriminatory attitudes. I can find no study that specifically says discriminatory attitudes. Uh, if if it's going to cause irrational beliefs, we should see it lowering analytical intelligence. And the data on that, as I said, is quite fickle. At the end of the day, we have to go on what data that we have available, the studies. If, if, if the atheists were right, that Christianity leads to these dangerous consequences, we should see it manifesting in the studies. We don't see that. I'm going to go on what the data at the end of the day. I'm not going to go on someone's experience. I'm going to go on what the data I have right there. I've met really bad atheists. I've met really bad Christians and vice versa. I met a lot of really good atheists. Aaron's a great guy. He doesn't advocate violence. So, again, I'm not going to go on my personal experience. I'm going to go on what the data tells me. Michael yeah. Jones, thank you. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you to both of our speakers.